We've got inflation that looks like at best it's moving sideways, and that's not enough for the Federal Reserve. We don't know entirely that we're done. We can't fully rule out action in June at this point. They definitely want to have the option not to hike at the June meeting. The statement all but basically admits to this is a pause. The risks are that now financial conditions in the regional banks, of course, will tighten. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. We never left. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brambitz. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Your equity market on the S&P 500, broadly unchanged. Negative 0.1% on the S&P. If you want a major move, PacWest, that bank, the regional in the pre-market, negative 37%. Fantastic reporting. Tremendous from Matthew Monks overnight saying PacWest has been weighing a range of strategic options, including a sale, according to people familiar familiar with the matter. TK, that stock down hard. Matthew Marks uh, talking to Jerome Powell, what, two hours afterwards? Really interesting uh, day, truly an historic day off of the Bloomberg reporting that we saw. I know the FT has picked it up as well with Piper uh, being the bank du jour for PEC uh, West. It, it's to the camp that says you can't have just one bank fail, two banks fail. There's reason these banks are challenged. It has to do with Fed strategy. It has to do with prices down, yields up, 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 and you got to believe there's more out there. Let's get to the statement from PacWest <clears throat> following that story. The bank has not experienced out-of-the-ordinary deposit flows following the sale of First Republic Bank and other news. They went on to say our cash and available liquidity remained solid and exceeded our uninsured deposits. Now, I want to talk about the deposits and just go through a couple of numbers for our audience. So this came from PacWest yesterday. They said total deposits are $28 billion as of May 2nd, with insured deposits totaling 75% versus 71% at quarter end and 73% as of April 24. Now, I want to compare that 75% insured deposits with SVB, where SVB had more than 90% of total deposits being uninsured. Now, PacWest will come out this morning, Lisa, no doubt, tomorrow, the day after, the day after that, and they can keep saying the same thing. We're a very different bank. And it won't matter. And this is, I think, the key distinction. You feel that kind of angst with right now people trying to game out who the weakest player is and then drive the uh, shares lower because this isn't just a solvency issue with respect to attracting deposits. It's also just a simple math issue where rates go higher. It is harder for these banks to incentivize depositors to come to them, especially if there are concerns about their existence going forward. So right now they can try to talk with partners. They can say that they're not really an any kind of dire straits and still those shares significantly lower and not really getting any kind of bid. This is something, Lisa, we've discussed over the last couple of days. Do we have a fair problem, return off capital, or agreed problem, return on capital? The former is only going to be addressed with a change to the FDIC limit. The latter can only be really addressed by the Federal Reserve moving something with interest rates. And I didn't get any indication of that yesterday. Drew Mattis of MetLife, I keep going back to the statement of his because I thought that it was really salient, saying, what a missed opportunity from the Federal Reserve to provide relief to the banks. An unexpected pause <clears throat> could have flushed out shorts in the sector and created more breathing room at a time when they are concerned about the balance of risks. Was an extra 25 basis points of, uh, of a rate hiking cycle really just pushing banks that already were vulnerable to reputational oh. risk of nothing else? I'm going to call it the distortions Thursday, and it's plural, distortions. And we're looking at deposits, and I think that's true, John, for certain banks, and maybe there'll be more out there we don't know. Far more, maybe it's about real estate. This is uh, puts here in the Wall Street Journal. Brookfield's Los Angeles office company is roiled by defaults. Now, that's commercial property in L.A. That's where PacWest is on uh, in Beverly Hills. But you know, I, I tell you, this is a set of distortions that are out there that we're seeing with a vengeance after the monks reporting yesterday. This is the next step, and you're right to bring it up, Tom. The discussion that Lisa and I are having is about a rate shock. It's about how to respond to a rate shock. The next step, perhaps, is credit fear. I think with PacWest and the story yesterday and the way everyone responded to it, it's not for me to say that a stock should be or shouldn't be oh, yeah. up or down. Yeah. That's not my job. That's not any of our jobs. And we'll talk to investors about that and analysts as well. I just think what happened yesterday was just the words PacWest and strategic options because we've seen how that plays out. We know the template for that. At least we think we do. So you see a bank and you see the words strategic options and you start to think, oh, I've seen this play out before. I know how this works. I know how this ends. 
it ends quite badly. Especially because at this point, why would anyone swoop in to have any deal with that, some sort of loan loss share uh, agreement with the FDIC, which is exactly the template that you're talking about. Getting a bit of news from TD Bank and First Horizon, mutually agreeing to terminate the merger pact. TD Bank, First Horizon cite uncertainty around regulatory timing. First Horizon shares down and down hard in the pre-market. They're going to host an investor call a little bit later on today. So here's the latest. First Horizon is down more than 40% in the pre-market off the back of this. TD Bank TK essentially unchanged. TD Bank is Toronto Dominion. We speak to Priya Miser and others in their st strategy and economics division. Mark McCormick as well. It's a Canadian success story coming south across uh, the border. First Horizon, Memphis, Tennessee, 7,000 uh, 7, people. Much, much smaller uh, uh, bank as well. And I'm getting up this down hard as you mentioned it, uh, uh, John. And on the chart here, we were at 15 and we're enjoying a center tendency, $9.25 right now. On Let's get through the price seat. action off the back of that, TK. Thank you. Looking at the equity market, negative 0.2% on the S&P 500. Yields a bit higher by close to three basis points at 336. A little bit later on this morning, an ECB rate decision, a news conference with President Lagarde, then onto Apple earnings after the close. Then tomorrow, payroll's just around the corner. Joining us now is Ben Laidler, global market strategist at eToro. Ben, wonderful to catch up with you, sir. I'm going to go back to the question of the week so far. Is it still just idiosyncratic? Yes, it is, but I don't think that um, I don't think we should downplay it, right? I think we have all the ingredients for a new growth scare, and I think equities, certainly in the short term, are probably a bit complacent to that. Uh, we've got the lagged effect of these five percent interest rates. We've got this bank scare, which continues to smolder and has disproportionate impacts for commercial real estate and small caps, and we have the debt ceiling showdown, which is sort of less than a month away. I think all that is going to accelerate uh, the growth slowdown, which has barely started yet. That's the bad news. But I don't think this is necessarily you know, bad for the market in the sort of medium term. I think it just accelerates everything, the growth slowdown, but also the inflation slowdown. And also it resolves this debate, this standoff between the Fed, which says no interest rate cuts this year, and the market, which I think is going to be right. And we're going to see interest rate cuts this year. And I think that is going to be ultimately good for the market, which is full of these sort of defensive, long-duration tech and healthcare stocks, which are especially sensitive to this. Time horizon important, Ben, with everything you've just said. I have to say, comparing what you just said in the last 60 seconds to what you've said repeatedly over the last few months, Ben, this is a shift for you, isn't it? it maybe in the short term. Um, but again, I, you know, I, we were always going to get this growth slowdown, right? Just with the Fed hiking interest rates to 5%, the two new ingredients are the tightening of financial conditions with what's going on with the, uh, with the small banks and this sort of smouldering, never-ending you know, um, crisis, and the debt ceiling. And I think debt ceiling will do two things. I think that's going to tighten financial conditions today, uh, and I think it's going to slow the economy going forward when we get the ultimate deal, which um, involves less sort of government spending. You put all that together, I think that will slow the economy. I think that will introduce some volatility. And, you know, remember, the VIX is well below 20 uh, I don't think equities have barely focused on the debt ceiling yet, unlike fixed income markets, which some of them have you know, priced in a bigger impact even than, than 2011. So I definitely think there are signs of short term complacency. I think the question is, what do you do about it? I think if the market sells off here, if the market responds to some of this, um, I think you buy it. I don't think you sell it. I think you reposition sort of into it. Um, you know, ultimately, I, again, I think this is a I think this is positive, not negative, because it accelerates the inflation slowdown and brings forward the interest rate cuts. I love listening to people and their different interpretations of the same series of events. It seems like you and Mike Wilson both agree on the next uh, series of couple of steps. It's just that the market response will be completely different in both of your views. Why is it that this market will fail to price in that growth recession, will fail to decline meaningfully in the face of a lot of uncertainty, volatility and real concern about profits? Because we've been so resilient so far. We just had 3.7% consumption growth in the first quarter. We've just had a, you know, a less bad earnings season. You know, we've been crying wolf on the growth slowdown for you know, a year now, and it hasn't happened. Um, but you know, I, I think there's a, uh, I don't think the laws of economics have completely broken down here. Right? I, I, I do think right. you know, the, the stars are sort of realigning here with the interest rates, with the banks, with uh, you know, the debt right. ceiling, uh, with where the market is. Right? The VIX is below 20. Uh, and I think the fixed income market is telling you very clearly that there are, you know, there, there are problems coming. I think you need to tweak that with a little bit of respect. But again, 
I don't think it's. Right. I don't think the response to that is to head for the hills. I think the response to that is, you know, get your buy list ready and just be, you know, aware that stock markets are not right. economies. What's really going to suffer here is small caps, is industrials, is commodities, which are all massively right. underrepresented in the stock market. Ben, you're going to be in your coronation pajamas tonight when Apple uh, releases as well. What is the symbolism of Apple? Their success, their use of cash. I looked at the share buyback today. Wow. What is the symbolism of Apple given all this turmoil, these distortions? So th three things. One, just the sort of fortress balance sheets, the huge cash flows, the big buybacks. You know, these are the new defensives. You know, one. Two, uh, expectations are very low. Uh, yes, we've had some relief, but, you know, we're not seeing good earnings growth. Um, and, and we know that. And, and, you know, where's the growth come from this quarter? It's come from the sort of cyclicals. That's exactly what you should be selling because the slowdown that is coming and the tech names which have, you know, reported these sort of less bad earnings, but still not great earnings, you know, very backward looking. I think those are the things you should be, you know, owning. And then thirdly, you know, these are these classic long duration assets. And if we're looking for places to hide, if we think inflation is coming down, if we think bond yields are, are going to stay well anchored, I'm just a lot less concerned about this 20, 30 percent premium uh, valuation to the market. Hey, Ben, wonderful to get your perspective. Ben Laidler of eToro, constructive <coughs> over the medium term, a little bit cautious in the short term. Your record market on the S&P 500, despite this conversation about growth risks, banking problems, the S&P is negative 0.2 percent. Lisa, that's not a big move, not a big move at all. Which is Ben Laidler's rationale for why this can withstand some of the growth slowdown and some of the other potential shocks, because it hasn't moved yet. It's been resilient. So that's the reason why I can keep going. Even with the standard and porous angst that's out there with only seven stocks or whatever leading the way, Laidler stepping up in late 2018, you've enjoyed a 62 percent lift, 12 percent per year. And the dog of dogs, the standard and poor is 500. Mm. That's, that's the call. It's the bull market call here. Later, hear when he was at HSBC, I was, I was saying, with you. I was with you in the booth. Me, load I was the with boat. you in the booth. How much is this just underestimating <clears throat> tech again and again? Because it really is just a couple of things that that's basically a correct drive statement. the entire index. We can go into that as we cut our team coverage of Apple here. We Matthew haven't even, Monks. We haven't even talked about coverage. the Federal Reserve at all. I know. Oh, no. <laughs> Detail. <laughs> you know, nobody, and I, the obviously we all did a lot of reading after the close yesterday, nobody I saw change their views following that Fed meeting. If you think they're done, you still think they're done. And if you think they're not, you still think they're not. <clears throat> in the equity market, negative 0.2%. In the next hour, Wei League of BlackRock. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell has opened the door to a June pause for interest rate hikes. Policymakers raise rates for the 10th time since early last year. And Powell hinted that might be the last one. But he did stop short of declaring victory in the fight against inflation. Meanwhile, the European Central Bank is poised to slow the pace of interest rate increases today. That's after its preferred measure of inflation eased for the first time in 10 months. Officials at the Central Bank are expected to raise a deposit rate by a quarter point to 3.25%. PacWest is trying to calm markets after a 60% stock plunge that made it the new focus of concern over regional banks. The bank says that core deposits have actually increased since March. It also confirmed it's talking with potential investors. Now, shares plummeted yesterday after Bloomberg reported PacWest was considering strategic options. In Atlanta, police have arrested the suspect in a fatal shooting at a medical building after a manhunt that lasted several hours. They say he stole a vehicle after then he attacked and then later fled on foot. Now, one person was killed and four others wounded. The suspect's sister says her brother was not mentally stable. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. Three large banks, really, from the very beginning, uh, that were at the heart of the stress that we that we saw in early March, the severe period of stress. 
Those have now all been resolved and all the depositors have been protected. I think that the resolution and sale of, uh, of First Republic kind of draws a line under that period of, uh, is an important step toward drawing a line under that period of, of severe stress. The word kinder doing a lot of work in those comments for Fed Chair Jay Powell. Compare and contrast that to the move we're seeing in PacWest this morning. That stock is down and down hard. More broadly, the equity market on the S&P 500 doing OK. We're negative here by 0.2% on the S&P. Yields are a little bit higher by three basis points, much lower in yesterday's session. Your 10-year, 3.3655 in the FX market. Bramo can tell you where the euro is against the dollar. It's 110. She's on Thank top you, of it. Lisa. <laughs> 110.54, <clears throat> just still in and around those kind of levels, Tom. A little bit later after the close, of course, Apple coming up. 7% of the index in one single name. 7% of the S&P 500. Andrew Mellon would tell Apple. you this is normal. This is normal. When you have angst and distortions, as we're talking about, you end up with concentration in a few ideas, whether that's good or bad. Is it a point to be debated? We looked at the CAC 40 in France and some 24 percent or something of the of the value of the French stock exchanges in two stocks. It might Ridiculous. be normal, but I just want to put this into perspective. The fact that Microsoft and Google now mm. account for 14 percent right. of the index, that's a record for those two names. So it might be normal, but it is an extreme version, perhaps, of what normal looks like. You know, like. what we do here, the heart of what we invented here with Bloomberg surveillance is aggregation with Matthew Monks, John leading last night with Bloomberg and Bloomberg reporting on the PAC uh, West debacle. But it, it's everybody out there in journalism pushing against, as you heard Jerome Powell in the beginning, we're under control. It was three banks. We're under control. We've got things under control. And there's anybody that's been through this stuff, including our next guest, that's just baloney. They're not under control. They're managing it tick by tick. Well, clearly they want to signal calm. <clears throat> but something that I was really thinking about yesterday evening, Tom, following those comments from the Fed chairman, in trying his best to sound responsible, is yeah. he running the risk of being irresponsible? And I, I wonder whether we're at that kind of tipping point now given what's developing and yeah. what that news conference sounded like yesterday. And the shock of Clarida saying we're not going back to 2% or I thought Dudley was on fire yesterday during our Fed show. Bill Dudley was as I've never seen him. What's important here, folks, is it's not about verbiage. It's about action. So what's the action in the pause language to start to calm the markets with price down and yield up? That's what we're waiting for. What did he say about the pause? We discussed <clears throat> it, but we didn't make a decision on it. We might be getting close to it. We're we in control. We're in control. <laughs> Something like that. We have that. options. You know, I use this, this this silly stat phrase, choice set. You know what the choice set is this. Pack West this morning. And maybe First Horizon, you see that. Don John, review that. First Horizon from 15 to 9. Yeah, the latest news from them is that <clears throat> TD Bank and First Horizon mutually agreeing to terminate the merger pact. I think this is interesting from TD's side of things. Unable to obtain the timetable for regulatory approvals. Now, Tom, is that because the regulator's busy doing other things? It's kind of an interesting comment, isn't it, Lisa, to get from them? Well, it's also that they want out of the deal. I mean, how much is that the issue, too? Valuations have plunged. Well, yeah, they have, and real estate is a big mystery here as well. Right now, truly expert on this, Mayor Rodriguez Valderas joins us with MRV Associates with just terrific experience on managing the message and the reality faced in bank boardrooms. Myra, in your note, you have too big to fail, and there's a too big to fail version 2023. What is that? What is too big to fail now versus when Andrew Ross Sorkin wrote his classic book a few years back? Well, we're certainly much more interconnected at every level in the United States and also globally. And this also really ties Chairman Powell's hands to a certain extent. You've got last year, you had 90 central banks raising rates. You still have the ECB raising rates, Bank of England, others. And so the Fed is dealing not just with a domestic inflation problem, this is global. If key central banks are raising rates, the Fed then runs the risk that if it also doesn't keep up, it's not going to be able to control inflation here. And you can have capital outflows. There are no walls Right. For investors, American investors can go invest uh, where there are higher rates. Do they need to be more aggressive in their language on pause to say we're going to set up pause for multiple meetings and monitor the data, et cetera? I sound like Yul Brenner, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do they, do they need to change the pause language? 
You know, that's an excellent question. Uh, when I started working at the Federal Reserve a couple of decades ago, uh, there wasn't any of the signaling, uh, the, the FOMC press releases, and even the pressers, which were much briefer. Uh, now we're in an era where everybody is looking for all of those cues and clues, and uh, even to the point of of handholding, and really, any Federal Reserve chair is a no is in a no win situation. If he were to say, "Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to pause," you would immediately have people who would say, "Oh my gosh, things must be really terrible." Uh, on the other hand, if he says, "We're going to march forward and raise rates," that's going to make a lot of borrowers, especially those that are leveraged, uh, really panicky. It would make the banks holding that kind of debt. Um, also uh, quite panicky because we have a lot of consumers and companies that are very, very leveraged presently, almost at historic levels. So the, the language was we are waiting for the data, we're still looking at all the factors, and, and then we will consider a pause. And I know it's frustrating. Everybody wants to be told this is exactly what's going to happen, but there's always been uncertainty in the markets and people have to have a historical perspective that we are always in uncertain times. No one can guarantee uh, what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, look at what's been happening now with the bank turmoil. We've right. moved from big regional banks to PacWest, which is a much, much smaller bank, but they too have been having interest rate risk management problems. And it's also the short sellers. Think of all of those market participants who are benefiting greatly from chasing after every bank that they suspect could well, possibly have a problem. And they make perception, uh, they turn it into reality, unfortunately. Myra, just to, to sort of build on that, there is a question of whether this angst that we're seeing in regional banks can be stopped without some sort of policy response, whether it's uh, cuts in rates or whether it's a potential shift in terms of ensuring a greater amount of deposits for a, a more cheap uh, kind of price. What's your view? Can this be solved without some sort of policy response, or are we going to just continue to see this cascade of potential weak players? I think what's important here is we do need policy responses at this stage. And if it is going to be to ensure a greater amount or different types of deposits, then that is going to have to come from the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC, and that it should be the bigger banks uh, that pay for that insurance. It shouldn't be the community banks that have nothing uh, to do with this. And uh, that's going to be a problem. You're going to have you're going to have the bank lobbyists fight against that. In terms of monetary policy, the problem is even if the Federal Reserve were to pause rates at the June meeting, we're still at rates that are at the highest in 15 years. So it's not like you can just turn off the spigot. And my big fear is that we're already starting to turn from an interest rate risk story to a credit risk story. You've had default rates that have been ticking up since last fall. Yep. They're, they're increasing now. You have telecoms, retail, pharmaceuticals, all of those sectors are already at above average default rates. And of course, the banks are the ones that are holding uh, those loans. So we're turning from an interest rate risk story to an asset quality story. Myra, we've got to leave it there. Thank you for that. Myra Rodriguez, Valladares of MRV Associates. Building on the conversation we're having here, we've had the rate shock. It's the credit shock just around the corner. And it's that what we're starting to play with in some of these regional names. June 14th is the next Fed decision. And let me tell you, I have got no idea where we are on June 14th. I, I, where are things going to be? I'm not sure we knew where we were yesterday. It was a crazy press conference. It was like a non-event, and there it is. Jane Foley of Rabobank coming up next. <clears throat> Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Welcome to the program. This is the situation in equities right now. Negative 0.1% on the S&P. After the close a little bit later, one big name making up more than 7% of the S&P 500 reports earnings. It's Apple. The Nasdaq going into that positive 0.2% in the bond market. You would not know what was happening to some of these regional banking names looking at this. The two-year, 10-year, 30-year looks a little something like this. Yields are higher by five basis points on a two-year, 385 
21. This bond market's been all over the place the last couple of days. I said it on Monday. Yields are up by more than 10 basis points. On Tuesday, they were down more than 10. And then on Wednesday, a repeat of Tuesday. Then this morning, higher once more. It has been like a meme stock, Tom in the bond market over the last few yeah. weeks. What I looked at last night was a three-month, 10-year spread. I've said a lot about it recently, so others have picked it up as well. And, John, in the shock of Matthew Monk's story on Pacific West, we went out near two full percentage points of difference in yield between the three-month T-bill and the 10-year. We went out to 193 point, uh, rounded up nine basis points. All you need to know if you're keeping score at home is I've never seen that banner before on TV. I've never seen, I've never thought about it. We're out solid three standard deviations over 30 years. Anyone who studies the mathematics of this would say there is massive stress within the system. You mentioned Pack massive. West. The stock is down by more than 40% in the pre-market at the moment. That stock a whole lot softer, negative off the back of that reporting from our colleague Matthew Monks yesterday evening that PacWest has been weighing a range of strategic options, including a sale, according to people familiar with the matter. This was a direct response to that from PacWest. The company said they have been approached by several potential partners and investors. Discussions are ongoing. The company will continue to evaluate all options to maximise shareholder value. They also offered a bit of detail on core customer deposits. Lisa, I'll share those numbers with you. They've increased since March 31, with total deposits totalling $28 billion as of May 2nd, with insured deposits totalling 75% versus 71% a quarter end and 73% as of April 24th. The communication they gave us when they released earnings is that things were stable. In fact, deposits had improved. You know what's not stable? Their share price. Their share price is down more than 40%, even with some of these disclosures as people try to game out. If someone does come in to buy them, there's also this issue of exactly what you said before. If the playbook is go down to zero before the FDIC sets in and basically says, look, we'll share the losses with you. Well, yeah, we'll share the upside too, but you can really get most of that. Why wouldn't somebody wait for that? I don't think this store is any different than the others, the color and the shades there. But I'm looking, this is on the Bloomberg, folks. I'm not making these numbers up. John, deposits went from 35 gazillion down to 28 gazillion, as you just mentioned as well. While they were doing that, they were loaning out money and this, that, and the other. Let's say they weren't being First Republic Bank. And those loans go out, and some of them are in bond equivalent or bond pricing where it's priced down. The loan value goes down now, and they've got to match that, and they run out of capital. I mean, that's that's the way this works. I mean, that's just basic accounting. You seemed like you were keen to say something. No, no, you, no. You gave me the lien. No, no. Okay, she gave not. me the Bramall okay. lean. I, I yeah. got the Bramall lean. I, I saw okay. it. I saw <laughs> it. I saw it. No, you got I the Bramall lean too? I did as well. We move, but look, honestly, no. I just will say this. We're speaking of two sides of the same story, right? Basically, <clears> this is a sort of escalating problem. And the bigger question this morning is, first of all, whether Jay Powell really is on this, really has a handle on what the issues are. Okay. Number two, what kind of policy response there needs to be? And number three, if it's okay, if we're just going to see an SNL kind of cri crisis or issue or whatever you want to call it, and it's just going to kind of basically weed out well, some of the weaker there's, players. There's, there's no, we got to go to Jane, but if there's nothing nefarious here, they can't call up the bank and say, fix this. The bank has to fix it. And look, John, as you mentioned, and Matthew Monks mentions, they're strategic options. I confused my Bramo leans. I think that was I'm checking out. I'm not listening to you, Tom. I think that's well, what that yeah, was. I, I think that was, yeah. it was one of those. There's welcome no to my, it was one of those. Welcome, welcome this to is, my this life. This is, I've got something that's to say. Like, like this. But this yeah. is... Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God, let's you know, I'm move done. on. I'm done here. <laughs> Jane Foley to save the show, head of FX Strategy at Rabobank in London. Jane, thank you for putting up with us as we look at American banking. How does the American banking crisis fold over into your foreign exchange analysis, or is it discreet and separate over there? Well, you know, I think many people, certainly in, in Europe, are looking at this and, and hoping that it is dis discreet and, and separate, that this is idiosyncratic. We've heard that word a lot uh, for, for the U.S. banking sector, but I, I don't think it's that simple. But, you know, there's, there's other real pressure points here. You know, you talk about the stress uh, as exhibited by the bond market. I, I think the market is, is caught up in this sort of global financial crisis mindset of assuming that we see these pressure points, we see the stress, um, and then the central bank will come in and, and cut interest rates. But actually, we are in a different environment now. We cannot uh, assume that the Fed is going to be cutting interest rates this year when we know that the Fed is still targeting inflation and inflation is, is very sticky and that, that's a problem and that suggests uh, as long as they've got that 2% inflation target it suggests 
that you know we might have more of these pressure points, more of these crises as the global economy gets used to this higher interest rate in environment, and that means that these crises may not just be about the, the, the U.S. regional banks in, in three, four, five months' time. Jenny, you're suggesting then that you believe the Fed will keep rates at five percent, even as we go through a painful adjustment. I think that's quite likely. Either that, or we have to, you know, ask the question: Are these central bank inflation targets too high? And, and I think the answer to that is, well, quite possibly yes, because I think we are in a, in a different um, environment for inflation as we, relative to the sort of post-Cold War up to sort of Trump, up to the, 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 the pandemic time. I think we are in a different environment now. We had Lagarde just a couple of weeks talking about, you know, geopolitical fault lines and, and different trading in, environments and, and that adding on uh, inflation. We've got supply chain adjustments all around us, if not for geopolitical reasons, but, you know, for uh, because of COVID or, or because of climate change too is that inflation we've got labor market shortages all throughout, all throughout most of the, the oecd so we're in a different inflationary environment we can't assume that the those central banks will just cut interest rates because that's what they've done before when we were in a low inflation environment and that means we could have more of these pressures and we know also that the central banks can't just say oh you know what we're, we're going to change the inflation targets because they're no longer appropriate because we know uh, that credibility is an issue and, and they can't just do that so easily so i think we we are going to have more stress exhibited across the markets in, in the coming months. So basically 2023 can be written with the title hiking into stress, hiking into weakness. And that seems to be uh, the theme across the board. There will be hiking into weakness potentially in certain pockets in Europe in less than two hours time when the ECB is expected to raise rates by 25 or 50 basis points. Are you expecting them to comment at all about the officer survey, the, the lender survey that just went out, where you can see a real credit contraction in the euro region in a way that people are very concerned about in the United States. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think that, that really is pertinent. We are seeing this tightness of, of credit conditions coming through in Europe. It, it's there. I mean, if you look at the, the data so far, well, you know, you can look at the GDP data for the Eurozone on Friday and say, yeah, you know what, that disappointed a bit. But at least there was growth. At least um, we avoided recession in, in the Eurozone over the winter. But as we move forward into the second half of this year, it is very likely that we are going to see a lot of that tightness that, that is now in those credit conditions being reflected in, in, in economic data. We think just the, the Eurozone economy will stagnate in the second half of the year. And then you've got to ask the question, well, if that's the case, what's the euro going to do? And, and we think it's quite likely right. that it's probably about as good as it gets right now for the euro. Jane, the heritage of Rabobank is simple. You guys own hedging. You've just, you're just on the other side of the speculative trade, helping businesses worldwide. Through your prism, what does the Pacific Rim look like in China in particular? Are you seeing a reopening after the COVID disaster? There is a reopening, and perhaps a, a pace that's perhaps disappointing, you know, many people. But there is a reopening, and you know, one thing that, you know, we are seeing, for instance, in, in Australia, you know, look at the, the trade data there. That's pretty strong because of the reopening in China, and also because of the lifting of of some tensions there. So there is a reopening, but I, I do think that the pace at which perhaps is a little bit slower than many people had had expected, you know, around about the turn of the year when we saw that reopening uh, trade really get going. So yes, it's happening, but you know, there is. You know, a slowdown anticipated, a recession anticipated for the for the U.S. at the end of the year. The, the eurozone probably going to stagnate, and 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 China, the, the 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 growth there probably disappointing. And I think if you just look, for instance, at the oil market um, overnight, you know, we see a lot of that disappointment reflected about the the outlook for the global economy. Great to catch up, Jane. Jane Foley of Rabobank going into the ECB a little bit later this morning. Comments there at the end. On China and the recovery there. Do you want to do that through the corporate lens? I think we can. Estee Lauder yesterday came out with mm. earnings. Their stock got obliterated in yesterday's session by close to 20%. And the commentary that we got, so the beauty company had to come out and cut its forecast for the third time in six months. The third time in six months. And that's a company that gets a lot of revenue out of China. And they said as travel recovers more slowly than expected in its key market. China. That doesn't speak to the narrative of yeah. the last couple of months. I have no knowledge here other than to say I don't think you conflate them in with luxury. I'd love for people to email in here and say, 
Is Estee Lauder going to the middle market or the fancy market? And I'm not sure which. It's actually a really good point. There is a question of strategy versus strategy. larger exactly. kind of geopolitical developments. And there is a question of whether yeah. they're sort of marooned between luxury and more everyday types of uh, makeup purchases at a time where post-pandemic, there's been a huge shift in that entire industry and how it's been consumed. I'm just going to the, uh, to the website, Tom, to get you some Futurist Hydra Rescue Cream. Which yeah, is fifty dollars. I've, I've looked at 50 that. But I'm that sorry. Why you know, that in revitalizing Supreme Plus moisturizer yeah. comes in at one twenty. I mean, that feels pretty luxurious to me. Well, and people are spending more on all of their, you know, creams. Well, and after things. our people. fourteen hour day yesterday, I think the Estee Lauder Advanced Night Repair Serum at two hundred twenty dollars. I'll take some of that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that sounds good. TK. It's particularly good, stirred and not shaken. I'll, I'll one up you for Christmas. I'll get you a pure color matte lipstick for thirty six dollars. <laughs> We could do this all day, no, couldn't we? <laughs> no, this, no, this, this uh, folks, I understand this. Oh, yeah. Matte lipstick at $36. That's a giveaway. That is not priced at the price you see in the basement of Bergdorf Goodman. Oh, there we go. I can tell you there's this from careful there's, reporting. There's a man who knows his lipsticks. Mm. What I know is if you can't <laughs> pronounce the name, it's probably French and expensive. That's true. I'm with gu you. Guerlain gu or something. Mm. It's something I, like that. I can't pronounce Gosh, it. Is that Swiss or French? I, we Got don't no ask. Uh -huh. They take They take. You, no, they well, take you. So when Bramo were left, was left alone with me and we were talking about, what were we talking about? What does LVMH not own. Oh, yeah, we just yeah. named a bunch of companies just, they, they already they, owned. They already owned, and then we got messages, <laughs> yeah. people writing it and being they, like, they, you guys, They don't own Gucci, but, but, you know, it's 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 challenge. They take U.S. dollars, that's what I know, okay. whether they're Swiss or French. Is China, is China that narrative, the new currency fluctuation, the new, we don't know. I mean, at what point is it the catch-all, too? I, we're going to listen to experts. Leland Miller, I really want to talk to I you. don't think we talk about this product category ever again on the show. I think that's what, that's what I think. I think we're done here. John, Some four day this week at DA Davidson, the Bam previewing Bar Apple earnings. I'm, I'm going to appeal that. The Next. brightening routine. <laughs> it's a five piece collection. The brightening routine. Now we know Tom Keen's secrets, keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell hinted the U.S. Central Bank's latest 25 basis points increase, interest rate increase could be the last, suggesting that officials may pause their tightening in June. But Powell pushed back against any expectations that the Fed will be cutting rates by the end of the year. A new poll says almost half of adults in the U.S. worry that their bank deposits aren't safe. That's a level of concern as high or higher than during the 2008 financial crisis. The Gallup poll was conducted last month following the failures of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. TD Bank and First Horizon have agreed to terminate their $13.4 billion merger agreement. In a statement, the two banks said there was uncertainty if and when regulatory approvals could be obtained. As part of the termination agreement, TD Bank will pay First Horizon $200 million. Shares of First Horizon plunged more than 40 percent. In a rebuke to the President Biden, the U.S. Senate has voted to reinstate tariffs as high as 254 percent on solar panels from Southeast Asia. The bill now heads to the President, who has promised to veto it. All this underscores a deep clash over continued U.S. reliance on foreign imports to drive renewable energy development. BMW posted first quarter earnings that were better than expected, thanks to strong sales of its most expensive cars. But the German luxury automaker left its outlook for the full year unchanged. Softening demand around the world is threatening sales. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. I think the Fed broadly missed the fact that, 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 that this interest rate risk that they had created by being very late to tighten monetary policy, that they created by flooding the bank with deposits by doing quantitative easing, that they created part of the stress on the banking system that arose when they had to tighten monetary policy by 5% in a little over a year. So the Federal Reserve has some culpability here. That's something only an ex-Fed official can say because the current Fed officials don't want to go there. That was Bill Dundee, the former New York Fed president and Bloomberg opinion columnist, laying some of the blame at the feet of this Federal Reserve for hiking rates so quickly from zero to five. 
in a little more than 12 months. From New York City this morning, welcome to the program. Let's give you a snapshot of things right now in the equity market. On the S&P 500, we are negative by 0.25%. Let's pick out a single name. I think you know where we're going. Pack West in the free market, we're negative 47%. <clears throat> Yesterday evening, our colleague Matthew Monks pointing out, according to people familiar with the matter, that the bank was weighing a range of strategic options, including a sale. The company itself saying in a statement, which came through overnight into this morning, that the company has been approached by several potential partners and investors. Discussions are ongoing. The company will continue to evaluate all options, Tom, to maximize shareholder value. What I would note is we've just now made a new low in the bid. What's very important, for those on radio, we're looking at $3.37, and basically over the last 40 minutes, we haven't been able to catch a bid. And I, I think it's important. What I would suggest, John, and maybe it's just anecdotal or maybe a quick study of history, is you go on from one failure, two failures, three failures, et cetera, the urgency by executives to get this fixed fast is dramatically heightened. I can't imagine what the good people on Rodeo Drive are doing uh, in Beverly Hills this morning. The stock is moving very quickly. Apparently, according to the company, deposits aren't. It's a key point. And this comes from PacWest as well. And I think we need to read out this line that comes in the statement that they've not experienced out of the ordinary deposit flows since the sale right. of First Republic Bank and other news. <clears throat> they go on to say that core customer deposits, Tom, have actually increased since the end of the first quarter. Yes. OK, they've increased. But from 19, let's review it again, as we did last hour, from 35 billion or 34 billion, whatever, who's counting down to 28 billion, John, is fine. But in that period, they did lots of loans, lots of real estate, lots of this, lots of that. And as Mr. Powell has moved rates up, bond prices, Lisa, help me here with my hands, bond prices are coming down. Real estate mortgage value is coming down. And so as your deposits are stable, that's great. But on the other side of the ledger, what's happening? And the answer is it's, it's a really good point, yeah. Tom. It's a really good point. There's a lot of things going on here that are contributing to a lot of nervousness around these names. And, Tom, to your point, sometimes this becomes somewhat self-fulfilling. You start to see these moves and they feed on themselves. They feed on themselves. And the, and the, the CEOs begin to act differently um, as well. Can we do something constructive and talk about something optimistic? Apple. I mean, you know, let's do that. Let's switch to Apple here. Uh, 20, 28% per year return over the last uh, 10 years is different than the banks. Thomas Forte knows this. He's senior research analyst. D.A. Davidson's on this afternoon's festivities. Tom, I know there's lots of strategic ideas out there as well. I went back on the Bloomberg. Folks, the F.A. screen on the Bloomberg is just absolutely stunning. And the shares taken in... They're Intel-like, except Apple was minting money unlike 15 years ago when Intel wasn't. And the share buybacks over the last number of years have been absolutely extraordinary. Are they going to drop a bombshell today on use of cash, on dividend, and further new share buybacks? I think it's going to be a reminder that Apple generates a ton of free cash flow. And if you're not going to buy the stock and Warren Buffett's not going to buy the stock, Apple's going to buy the stock. So I expect another increase in their share repurchase plan. Uh, when you couple that with their dividend, though the dividend yield is still quite modest, uh, they're returning a lot of that free cash flow they generate back to shareholders. And I think that's contributing to the strong performance for the stock. What's your glide path on revenue? I know they had a couple years ago a big pandemic boom. Everybody had to buy a computer at home. Maybe they were giving them out at First Republic Bank. But what is the single-digit revenue glide path of Apple forward? So if you think about Apple on a near-term basis, they should benefit from the reopening of China, the end of the Chinese government COVID-0 policy, to the extent that 10 percent of their sales are to Chinese consumers. Uh, they have seen some softness in some of their economically sensitive revenue, including advertising. Think of it as advertising for app downloads, especially in mobile gaming. Uh, but there's reason to expect that uh, as the economy improves and on the strength, continued strength of the iPhone on the 5G uh, network upgrade, that Apple may be able to sustain double-digit top-line growth. The good news is that there's easing of a very significant headwind in FX, uh, to the extent that the dollar weakened materially versus the pound, the euro, and the Japanese yen in the March quarter versus the December quarter. So there's reason to be optimistic that revenue growth can improve going from here. 
Tom, we've written some stories uh, that talk about the stealth move away from China, away from production in China, and away from just in general, how big the Apple footprint is there. Are you expecting to hear anything about costs incurred on that transition away from the second largest economy in the world? Uh, the answer is yes. And Tim Cook is an amazing uh, CEO. I refer to him as CEO by day and diplomat by night. But he has a challenge here to the extent that he has to uh, broaden his supply chain and move out of China to, to some degree. Uh, the good news is that as he expands into India, he kind of has the footprint of what he did in China, or sorry, the game plan of what he did in China and mirror that for India. But yes, I think they have to more than stealthily uh, diversify their supply chain so they're less dependent on China. And I think that's going to be a challenge. Especially at a time when companies seem to be rewarded for saying chat GPT or artificial intelligence. And it's very difficult to talk about these high, uh, highfalutin ideas when it's just nuts and bolts moving things around the world and trying to put things together. Is there anything in the latest hot trend that Apple can hang on to for future growth? Or are they kind of tied to an old economy kind of reality that's very much tied in the physical world? Yeah, so Tim Cook last quarter talked about AI as being a horizontal technology, not a vertical one. So when you think about Apple and AI, they're using AI on many levels. I think of Siri as an example. And I think that what you're going to see is that uh, I'm of the belief that longer term, they could totally create a car uh, versus just having kind of the consumer facing operating system in the car with CarPlay. That would be leveraging a lot of our artificial intelligence, uh, depending on your view of, you know, the metaverse and augmented reality and virtual reality. There's opportunities there as well. I think Apple is quietly using artificial intelligence on many levels. Uh, Microsoft's better at PR. Apple, I would argue, is better <laughs> at technology. Tom, that comment at the end there, <laughs> that is oh. not the first time I've heard that. Are you suggesting, pretty obviously, that you think that the company that we're all looking at for some kind of AI revolution is just the one that's doing a better PR job right now? I, I absolutely feel that way, although it is hard to debate who's better at PR, uh, Apple versus anybody. I mean, Apple's amazing at PR. Yeah. But yes, I'm of the belief that uh, when it comes to AI, when you compare uh, Microsoft and Apple and Google, uh, Microsoft's doing the best job in PR. Uh, I didn't think we were going to have this conversation. That's brilliant, John. Thanks for bringing that up. Tom Forte, what's the glide path on the chip? I always go back to the A series of chips. Is there room for improvement to ever more amaze us with their chip development over the next two or three iterations? The answer is yes. The beauty of Apple is the next device is always the fastest and the best. And I think that when you saw them take some of their chip production and chip design in-house, uh, that enabled yep. them, again, going back to PR, to, to promote how this product's better and to get us to upgrade. So, yes, I think the glide path is a, a good one there. Hey, Tom, great to catch up. Thank you, sir. Tom Forte there of DA Davidson going into Apple earnings after the bell a little bit later. I heard those precise words from an analyst last week about Google. Don't write Google off. And they were essentially saying that they think that Microsoft is just doing a better PR job right now than Google is when it comes to artificial intelligence. Why are you laughing at me? That was so snarky. If I'd said that, I'd be in the surveillance timeout chair. You say it, it's charming. Well, he basically <laughs> said it, and we've heard it from a few people now, Bramo, with regards to Microsoft. I mean, who's binging, right? I mean, that's ultimately what it comes down Who to. Who actually goes on Bing? I still don't know anyone that goes <laughs> on it's Bing. The, it's the actual default uh, search engine that comes up on certain laptops. So that's the reason why Bing and has as you much download traffic. Chrome. I thought that and was then, a thing. <laughs> that's exactly what people do. Well, here's the question. Can they make Bing better than than Chrome. Can they make it better than Google? And a lot of people saying, Look, eh. So this is like with Anna Ragrana looking at cloud. Where's the cloud in five years? Where's the cloud in 10 years? And with Apple, is the chip, the A15 chip. Is there an A16 chip? Is there an A20 chip? And does the chips just continue to iterate? I, I mean, wh why do I li like this toy? The battery lasts longer than the last time. It's that stupid. Until it gets old and they slow it all down and yeah, they Burn purposely do that. We're going to start it's that a, again. It's what it feels on. like. No, it's a thing. This is known. It's a thing. They it's do. known. It's not this just the bat, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a thing. Waylia Blackrock coming up next. We won't talk about that. Equities down by 0.3% on the S&P 500. No one around this table slept. It's probably going to get dangerous as the show progresses. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>
We've got inflation that looks like at best it's moving sideways, and that's not enough for the Federal Reserve. We don't know entirely that we're done. We can't fully rule out action in June at this point. They definitely want to have the option not to hike at the June meeting. The statement all but basically admits to this is a pause. The risks are that now financial conditions in the regional banks, of course, will tighten. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Tom Keen and Lisa <coughs> Rabbit. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Let's get straight to this market where we're negative 0.3% on the S&P 500. Looking at PacWest, negative 45% and getting absolutely hammered. Some reporting by our colleague yesterday evening, Matthew Monks, pointing out that PacWest has been weighing a range of strategic options. Had the statement from the company overnight into this morning. PacWest pointing out that the company has been approached by several potential partners. Investors, discussions are ongoing. The company will continue to evaluate all options to maximize shareholder value. They're very, very keen to point out what's happening with deposits, Tom. They say they have not experienced out of the ordinary deposit flows following the sale of First Republic Bank and other news. Well, I'm, I'm looking at the, the banks here, and Pacific West has been is, has been completely pushed aside here by the bid on First Horizon in the last 10 minutes. FHN, uh, John, these are all differing stories, aren't they? Matthew Monk's writing up Pac West as you review. First Horizon is where TD of Toronto walks away. It's just all there is to it. But the outcome's all the same. And to me, the shift here occurring in the last say, 48 hours is from <clears throat> an interest rate analysis over to a credit analysis, which is why it's so important to go to Wei Lee here in a moment. The Federal Reserve says the U.S. banking system is sound and resilient in its latest statement. Chairman Powell was keen to signal just the same in the news conference yesterday, Lisa, but we've gone from bank to bank to bank to bank. And we're going from one bank to the next this week, too. I love what the uh, former Fed president of the Atlanta Federal Reserve, uh, Dennis Lockhart, had to say in an interview on Bloomberg Television last night. He said, I would like to believe that Jay Powell has information that suggests the situation is contained or containable. I would like to believe. Not exactly a ringing endorsement. And that really is what this is, because we don't <clears> have <throat> a sense of what they know, especially given some of the distress that's been baked in some of the share prices. You brought up a former Fed official, so let's throw in another one. We heard from Kaplan a little bit earlier this week, and I think... Tom, he really started the conversation that you're building, Gun. This was the rate shock <clears throat> that we're discussing right yeah. now. The next phase potentially is a credit shock, and we still haven't really got our hands around what that might look like. And this is like Richard Fisher, even though he does have some economic cred. Kaplan and Fisher are more financial-based than economics-based, uh, and I think that's a critical point here within what is a crisis. Moments ago, he joined us yesterday on set. Torsten Slock, was it the morning or the afternoon? I can't remember. <laughs> Torsten Slock was sitting next to me with Apollo, and John, he goes to the heart of the matter and the credit dynamic wrapped into the recession. Small and medium-sized businesses linked to small banks like PacWest and First Horizon. The good news, Tom, I can confirm he was next to you. You didn't imagine okay, it. Would, um, it was in the afternoon. You. It was when we were talking about the Federal Reserve, at least I think it was. In the equity market right now, we are negative 0.3% on the S&P 500. Yields are a little bit higher by a single basis point. Looking out for the ECB a little bit later in about an hour and 12 minutes from now, we'll get a decision from them. Lisa, the euro going into all of that unchanged at 110.64. I'm shocked. This is my shocked face. Today, 8.15, we are getting that ECB rate decision. 8.45 <clears> is when Christine Lagarde takes the helm and explains why they are raising rates into potential weakness and what the threshold is for them to stop. Today, also, we were just speaking about artificial intelligence and chat GPT. This is interesting. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris is meeting with the CEOs of Microsoft, <laughs> Alphabet, and, uh, and OpenAI to talk about potential risks that could be emerging. And I do wonder whether there's a policy implication or whether this is just simply uh, a PR move ahead of what clearly are some pretty major shifts. And we are getting a slew of earnings. We just got Shopify cutting jobs and talking about selling some of their businesses. This is really going to be an ongoing grind of names. But Apple, front and center, after the bell, given the fact that it is such a major component of the index and a major component of the gains year-to-date, oh. with almost 30 percent year-to-date returns at a time when people had written off big tech. And I got three sources, Lisa, saying that we should look for a share buy buyback announcement. Usually we don't see that during earnings. I mean, they do it afterwards or something. And I really wonder if you see a use of cash announcement here and then some form of new bond offering from Apple. Well, you saw what down. Tom Forday said 10 minutes ago. Yeah. You heard what he said. If investors don't want the stock, Apple will buy it. 
Yeah. That's kind of like the cheat mode in the Apple stock, yeah. right, for the bulls. There's been a massive it's, capital it, return it, program it, it, for a long time. I went back and looked here back 15 years at Intel. Intel did this. They bought back all that stock, but Intel wasn't the profit machine Apple is. There's a big, big difference down at the bottom of the income statement. Those numbers come after the close. Joining us around the table right now, Wei Li, Global Chief Investment Strategist at BlackRock. Wei Li, let's talk about what Tom's discussing and, and build on it. We've had the rate shock. Are you looking for some kind of credit shock to follow? We are expecting a, a version of credit tightening and crunch to come through to do some of the output destruction work for the Fed, which is why we have now entered the uh, beginning of the pause phase. Uh, they signaled pause yesterday. We're expecting um, we are getting close to peak, if not at peak. But more importantly, from the meeting yesterday is that they continue to consistently reiterate no cuts for this year. And markets are pricing in three cuts for this year. And that disconnect is going to be a source of uh, further market volatility. If I look at three months, 10 spread out to 193 basis points, I can state I've never seen it in a textbook. I've never thought about it. I've never was back 30 years. It's a three standard deviation move. Totally unprecedented. In your note, you talk about short term government paper. What will short term government paper do when in some form the three month 10 year differential cracks? Well, we expect a short-term government paper to give you income, which we haven't had in fixed income for a very, very long time. And that is notwithstanding the debt ceiling uncertainty, and that is notwithstanding this dispersion, this huge, huge kind of discrepancy in terms of yields that you get in three months versus 10 years. If you hold it out for uh, maturity, some of that uncertainty uh, also kind of uh, washes uh, washes away. The curve is extremely uh, inverted. Uh, it's so inverted uh, that uh, we think uh, the, the, the next move is for a 10 year yields to, 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 to come back up and, 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 and curve to steepen from those extremely inverted, uh, inverted levels, uh, which is why we long the front end, but uh, we are less constructive on the long end of the curve. Wait, did Jay Powell give you confidence that they had under control a sense of how deep some of the banking fissures go? Can he give anyone confidence at this uh, at this juncture, seeing that it's still early days? One thing I would say, though, in terms of uh, what's uh, playing out in the banking sector, is that uh, we don't think this is a banking specific systematic systemic type of crisis. We think that this is just another expression of financial cracks appearing in response to the fastest rate hike cycle since the 80s. Arguably what happened in um, the UK last September with the LDI uh, guilt uh, yield spike uh, volatility episode was another expression of this financial cracks appearing. We know that as we fight inflation in a world shaped by supply, uh, cost of fighting inflation is higher and cracks would appear and it would carry economic uh, cost and that's starting to come through. What's the next progression in this cascade of cracks that you see and is the only policy <laughs> response that can really address this rate cuts? or provision of liquidity. Um, they have uh, been very swift uh, with that to uh, start with. But now the boundary is getting blurred a little bit through the transmission channel of credit tightening. So which is why we, are, we think that we're basically at a uh, peak uh, rate uh, unless inflation surprises on the upside because of this huge uncertainty in terms of how big the credit crunch uh, is, uh, is likely going to be. And it's still early days to quantify precisely. Can we turn to Tom's big focus at the moment? We thought we'd all be bailed out on the growth side by China's reopening. We've had a couple of signals, the manufacturing PMI in the last week, some company earnings indicate that maybe the reopening and this boom we might get this year is a little bit of a head fake. Where do you come down on that now? Well, the Chinese uh, restart, the reopening, has been uh, is likely going to be very domestic focus. You see consumers spending more and travels during the past uh, bank holiday week has been uh, very strong. So consumer is going to be, play a big role in this uh, in this restart, which potentially limits uh, mm -hmm. the magnitude to which actually you can come to the rescue of developed market uh, economy and the recession uh, foretold. We're still uh, of the view mm -hmm. that. 
because Chinese growth can clog above 6% for this year. But uh, we're also still of the view that uh, in the U.S. we're likely uh, heading into recession second half of the year, especially as consumers start to kind of uh, run down on their savings buffer and their spending appetite is starting to stall. You're one of the most important Chinese voices in the Western world right now with BlackRock, with your prodigious abilities in mathematics. And the zeitgeist I see among corporate officers is to expand off the Pacific Rim West in China, to not be in two cities or three cities, including Beijing, but to move into five, six, seven cities. John mentioned LVMH the other day is an example of this. Do you perceive that there can be a three-year, five-year, 10-year expansion by Western companies into other China cities, or are we always wedded to Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Beijing? I think when it comes to managing geopolitical risk and diversifying geopolitical uh, risks, uh, I, I, I think it's really uh, important to recognize that the world today is more intertwined. It's more intertwined uh, and the trade linkages are stronger as well. So no longer can we just fade geopolitical uh, risk premium. We have to kind of think about persistent risk premium as we construct uh, portfolios. And when it comes to China risks and, and spreading that out, both for investors and corporations. I think that is a certain direction of travel, certainly. Wei Li, this was wonderful. It's good to see you. It always is here in New York City. Wei Li of BlackRock, thank you very much. BlackRock at the moment and Wei Li's team underweight, mostly underweight equity markets at the moment. The broader equity market, negative 0.4% on the S&P 500. Right now, looking to pack west. Just to keep on top of that for you, we are negative 45%, Tom in the pre-market. That's the name to watch this morning for a lot of people. A little bit of bounce. We're not getting it with First Horizon, the shock off TD right there. We're still looking right, really right down in the bid with First Horizon 7.39. I'm going to steal that from Whaley, that phrase directional travel. Yeah. That's the mystery of the Pacific Rim is the ability to invest and get away from the stereotypes of 10 and 20 years ago. Can we expand out in a business enterprise? Like the Apple's looking at India is just one example. Well, for the growth path, it's the what next of it after 2023. Exactly. The margin, yeah. We're looking for that reopening pop, and then, yeah. Lisa, it's the what next, down to what? Yeah, and this is really, honestly, we aren't sure, but most people think significantly lower than where we've been. Equities right now, negative 0.4%. In the next hour, a decision from the ECB. Is it 25 or 50? Chris Turner of ING joining us shortly. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell has opened the door to a June pause for interest rate hikes. And policymakers raised rates for the 10th time since early last year. And Powell hinted that might be the last one. But he did stop short of declaring victory in the fight against inflation. Meanwhile, the European Central Bank is poised to slow the pace of interest rate increases today. That's after it preferred measure of inflation eased for the first time in 10 months. Officials at the Central Bank are expected to raise a deposit rate by a quarter point to 3.25 percent. Bloomberg's learned the European Union is discussing a new sanctions mechanism. It would target third countries that it believes aren't doing enough to prevent Russia from evading sanctions. The process would focus on those that can't explain spikes in trades of key products or technologies. Funds managed by Apollo Global Management Affiliates have agreed to buy Arconic. Now, the all-cash transaction has an equity value of about $3 billion. The deal represents a 36% premium to Arconic's closing price on February 27th. Arconic makes part of the parts for aerospace, automotive, and other industries. And PacWest is trying to calm markets after a 60% stock plunge that made it the new focus of concern over regional banks. The bank says that core deposits have actually increased since March. It also confirmed it's talking with potential investors. Shares plummeted yesterday after Bloomberg reported PacWest was considering strategic options. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. No one should assume that the Fed can protect the economy from the potential, you know, short and long term effects of a failure to pay our bills on time. It's essential that, that the debt ceiling be raised in a timely way. Failure to do that would be unprecedented. 
uh, we'd be in uncharted territory and the, and the consequences to the U.S. economy would be highly uncertain and could, could be quite averse. That's the warning from the Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell there yesterday in the news conference following hiking interest rates by 25 basis points and signalling there was a discussion on a pause but not a decision on a pause. Wait for June for that, the middle of June, June 14th. And I think we've said a few times already this morning, who knows where we are June 14th and how many banks have failed between now and then. That's an overlay over the debt ceiling debate. I mean, that's got a June 1 date on it and a zeitgeist this morning. And it's a really good point, John. You've got two overlay stories that are calendar items out to June. I don't think that's a small matter. Could be in a very, very different position, I think we all hope. That we're in a better position in the equity market why right now, we negative zero point three. Why, why would you hope we're in a bad position? <laughs> because it's bank after bank. What are the banks tomorrow? <laughs> no, no, no. What, Tom, no, Tom, Tom, Tom. Language is important, so allow me to yeah. say something and then you listen. That's yeah. how conversations work. Right. Thank you. I hope it will be a better situation because why would I hope it would be a bad one? I'm not saying it will be. I'm not saying it's I... likely to be. I'm not saying it won't be. <laughs> Oh my God! This, I mean, this it, goes did back. You, it's, you, <laughs> did you hear? Did that no, go just I, in it and out the other? No, I go no. back to 1986. Oh okay. my goodness! This I'm is unraveling like 86 this morning. <laughs> and did, did we expect to see First Horizon come out here two hours ago? No. And what's tomorrow? Boom! I've got no idea. No. I'm not saying it's going to be good. Are we not allowed to hope that it might be better? I hope We're things hoping. are better, too. Thank you, Lisa. I uh, support that, and I also hope mm. we resolve the debt ceiling. Thank you. And we potentially get stability. It doesn't mean any of us think we will. Oh, Bramo optimism. Dear That's, me. <laughs> Bramo move on. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> that was painful. OK. The S&P 500, negative 0.4%. TK, Anne-Marie's up next. Take it away. Three months tens, 187 basis points is the hope for this morning. Amory Horton is hoping in Washington, where she is our Bloomberg Hope correspondent. Amory, I am <laughs> thunderstruck by the immediacy of June 1st. I guess it's a calendar item, yeah. but truly explain for our global audience what June 1st suddenly means for your Washington. Well, that's the date that Secretary Yellen has put out that the U.S. will exhaust these extraordinary members, uh, measures they've taken to pay our past bills. Some Republicans are saying they think it's a little bit too conservative and maybe she's trying to get everyone in a room. But that's the date from the Treasury Department that they are very concerned about and why you're starting to see a lot more angst in Washington, particularly with some people, not everyone, is because that leaves only a few working days for this president to be in Washington at the same time as Speaker McCarthy and at the same time as Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer to hammer out a deal. It's actually just seven, including a weekend day. Now, things and plans can change, but the president does have some foreign travel. Obviously, the Senate and the House have a number of uh, days that are on recess. So that is why everyone is concerned. And all eyes will be on this meeting on Tuesday with congressional leadership at the right. White House. But if you're listening to Karine Jean-Pierre yesterday, the president's press secretary, it sounds like the president is preparing to give Speaker McCarthy more of a lecture than actually having a negotiation. If we say the, the cliche, kick the can down the road, translate that in Washington speak right now. Well, this is what Mike McKee said yesterday. When you run out of land, build more land. Uh, so this is potentially one option. The Wall Street Journal actually talks about some of the reporting they have about the White House scrambling to get potentially this option on the table. But many analysts have been saying this to me for weeks. And this is a way, actually, both sides can claim victory. So what they would do is have a short-term extension of the debt ceiling and say, in that time, we'll negotiate. Well, that would then nicely um, come to the uh, other deadline they have of striking a deal on government spending. So potentially in the fall, September 30th, they can link these two together, have a short-term increase of the debt ceiling, discuss spending cuts, which Speaker McCarthy says he would not have a clean debt ceiling bill ever. He has to have fiscal spending cuts attached to that. Maybe they can do all of that in September. And then each side can claim a little bit of victory. The issue, of course, would be some House Republicans would then have to take three votes on raising the debt ceiling. That is going to be incredibly challenging. And that could be a revolt for the Speaker from some of those hardliners in his 
conference. And Marie, is anyone actually talking about using the 14th Amendment to just singly go it alone with President Biden, just simply saying we are not legally allowed to fail and default on our debt? It's been dangled out there. Uh, there has been signals of potentially the White House looking at every single option, including that one, to make sure they do not default. I think at the moment, these are those Hail Mary potential moments, and we are just not there yet. I think things will become a little bit more clear after this meeting the president has with congressional leadership, most notably Speaker McCarthy on Tuesday. Yeah. And Marie, meanwhile, amid all of the debt ceiling uh, discussions, we do hear that President Biden has nominated someone to fill Leo, Leo Brainerd's uh, seat, Philip Jefferson, who was nominated, I believe, last year and rose to be one of the Fed mm -hmm. governors. She, he also uh, nominated Adriana Kugler to fill the role on the governor board. I'm wondering why now, especially right after the Fed meeting, is there some sense of timing here? Why now? Why not months ago? I mean, when we first heard and reported, including myself, about Lael Brainerd moving over to the National Economic Council, I first heard about that the end of January. We are now in May, and this isn't even official yet. We, uh, Josh Wingrove and Kate Davidson scooped this yesterday. Likely the administration will make this announcement on Friday. But I think it's fair to say they dragged their feet a bit, and they are behind when it comes to these nominations. Again, Lael Brainer took over that job at the White House at NEC in February. Um, one issue the administration have is they were under immense pressure from Senator Bob Menendez and some other Democrats for the first ever appointment of an individual, an economist from the Latino community to join the board. Um, and that really kind of changed some of the direction that the White House was taking with who they were going to and how they were going to look at the new makeup of the Fed board. And that's why you see this happening now and not potentially a month or two months ago. MH, thank you for the update. Anne-Marie, down in Washington. On the latest on the debt ceiling, the composition of the Federal Reserve and finally securing some nominations, potentially getting them confirmed for this Fed board going into the next meeting, which is in the middle of June. We're looking potentially for them to signal a pause. Although I go back to something I said a little bit earlier, Tom, the people who think this is a pause still think this is a pause, and the people who think they're going to keep hiking yes, interest rates, city, yes, I didn't still think they're totally going to keep agree. on hiking interest rates. It's a really, really good point. And of course, I go to the point where we didn't hear anybody talk about multiple pause, multiple meetings of pause, which is where some would suggest they need to get too fast. But you're absolutely right that the people looking for higher rates in some form did not give way yesterday. You know what's interesting? The debate around recession within the Federal Reserve. This whole idea that the staff are forecasting a recession and you've got the chairman coming out, Lisa, and saying, I think it's more likely we won't have one than we'll have one. And that's what counts as dissent on the Federal Reserve. Right he basically now, was saying, I mean, let's just be really <laughs> honest. He basically said, you know, this is healthy. This is great. It's so good that they can have their opinion and I can have mine. Mine is right and mine wrong. And, and, I'm not, um, and I'm not necessarily going to knock it down here, but that's basically what we're going to follow. And isn't it good that everyone can have their own opinion? And yet... A completely unanimous decision, even though Austin Goolsby has been pretty vocal about really questioning the logic of well, raising rates by 25 basis points yesterday. A million years ago, I had a whole series of interviews with Jeffrey Frankel of Harvard, who's the guy who took us away from a strict interpretation of what is a recession. And the answer is it's squishy enough now where I disaggregate and say, what portion of America is in recession right now? Commercial real estate deal makers, they're in recession right now. There's no question about that. Would you say, Tom, this is a difference in analysis at the Federal Reserve or just a difference in the individual making the call because of what they need to signal versus what they're both. actually The thinking? answer's both. There's a lot of the need to signal going on. There's a, there's a lot of that. I, I do wonder. You never hear Fed officials say recession just around oh, the Oh, no, no, I mean, they're not allowed to say that. Because they believe yeah. that becomes self-fulfilling. Yeah. Well, Neil Kashkari has been pretty vocal about that, though, but not necessarily the head of the Fed. Right. That's true. It's, it's a problem. It is. Live from New York City, this is Bloomberg Surveillance, where we hope things are just really bad. And if you don't understand that joke, I'm not going over it again. It's the equity market on the S&P 500. We're negative 0.3% on the Nasdaq. We're totally unchanged. I know some people sitting there thinking, yeah, finally you said it. Yeah. <laughs> it's the quiet part out loud. In the bond market, let's get to bonds. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year. Going into the ECB a little bit later this morning, 45 <clears> minutes from now. We're looking at the two-year at 381. And the euro shaping up as follows in the FX market. Go on, Lisa. <laughs>
I you can't. got this. You got this. One ten. Thank I, you. His bid. I mean, we could make some story about. Well, it's a little Ken bit stronger close to one eleven last week. Give us some credit. Oh, all right. To, wow. You know, but honestly, I mean, to come up with a story. Congratulations, and you're doing you know amazing work coming up with some narrative Thanks, every single Bramo. day. It's about whether it ticks up for two basis points or down, but it's been in this range for quite I a while. Appreciate it. Just keep throwing cold <laughs> water on my. On Jane, my work. Jane Foley. We never even got to it. But Jane Foley, this day of the ECB, says we grind back to one hundred six. Uh, we killed it with her. You know. We spoke to an FX strategist and never asked about foreign exchange. Yeah, that's that great. You just nailed that. <laughs> great that's the kind of day it is. Hour. Let's try and do better with Pac West. <laughs> Let's bring up that name. That stock is down Let's this morning. Stocks with Winnie Caesar. Negative 36% <laughs> on Pac West right now. The latest news on a serious note, our team reporting that Basically, they're weighing a range of strategic options. The bank itself has come out with a pretty lengthy statement, actually. It's worth a read. A lot of detail in there about deposits and how things have stabilised. They say this about our story, essentially. The company has been approached by several potential partners, Lisa. Investors as well. The discussions are ongoing. The company will continue to evaluate all options to maximise shareholder value. And talking about deposits, it doesn't look that bleak, which is why it's interesting that shares are down as much as they are. And then not only for them, but pretty much anyone who's remotely associated with them, those shares are down too. Take a look at Western Alliance, another one of those uh, banks that really have been under fire. Those shares down 14% in pre-market trading. Why? Because they've been lumped in with PacWest. I mean, there's really no other reason. And you could see this throughout the regional banking space. First Horizon though a bit idiosyncratic here sorry uh, down 44 percent but just just simply because of the story here which is the TD Bank uh, has agreed with First Horizon to terminate the previously announced merger which had been agreed upon let's be honest before all the turmoil in the banks and I'm just going to suggest they were very excited to get out of this deal at the price that they agreed to pay I mean just speculate well, two points one possibly quite possibly and you're right to raise that point but two it is somehow linked to the broader story potentially because they keep talking about the lack of regulatory timetable and implied that wasn't associated with the deal, which implies that it's something else, and we know what the something else might be. <laughs> but that's actually a great point, because what it raises is, will there be some sort of regulatory shifts that are coming sooner than later with respect to some of the regional banks? Before we move on, just want to bring in Shopify, not in the banking sphere, but they pr released earnings where they said that they're cutting jobs for the second time in less than a year, uh, and basically the CEO saying, I don't want to bury the lead. After today, Shopify will be smaller by about 20%. They also are selling off their logistics business to Flexport, to try to compete with Amazon. And this really talks about consolidation at a time where bigger is stronger. The stock is up 16% in the pre-market. The other big one after the close, of course, the biggest weighting on the S&P 500. Apple earnings coming out a little bit later. Payrolls report due tomorrow on the heels of the Fed rate hike yesterday. Winnie Caesar of Credit Sites has this to say. We think the bar for a June rate hike is pretty high. We would need to see a significant upside surprise in economic data, whereas July seems more in play to us. Tom, that's interesting. We have long expected the Fed to hike to levels close to current levels and then hold for an extended period, meaning that the current rate cuts priced into the market in the second half. Drum roll, Tom, seem a bit early. I would go there, July 26, past Labor Day to September 20, November 1, in that dreaded final meeting of the year, December 13th. This is the conversation of the day for global Wall Street and the short-term paper market and what we see in liquidity and solvency. Winnie Caesar, expert at this and global head of strategy at Credit Suisse. Thank you so much for coming in, given the distortions that we see in the, in the, the market. Folding in the word pause and what it means looking out in, in your comments, as John just mentioned, what is the key distortion now in terms of what we care about? Liquidity and solvency in the market. How threatened is liquidity in the market? How threatened is solvency in the market? We think still that liquidity is the big issue. Solvency definitely has its challenges. I think that those challenges are much more isolated. We see that in the triple C universe. We see that in some pockets of commercial real estate, some pockets of the leveraged loan right. universe. But liquidity, cash has been king, and liquidity is being distorted by the Fed, by uncertainty around the path for rate hikes, by uncertainty around the debt ceiling. We're all seeing, seeing the distortions in the T-bill market as well, which is very much directly linked to these liquidity issues and expectations around the debt oh, ceiling. Oh, I hate ways to go here, John. Can we make this a three-hour conversation? <laughs> Bring up the bank board Lisa just brought up. On radio, it is three-storied banks with three different stories. And, Winnie, this all folds into your expertise, the idea of, of a Beverly Hills bank that got L.A. real estate, they got maybe paper, Johnson's deposits are okay, Western Alliance, a bar chart from Bloomberg out on Twitter this morning showing their commercial real estate exposure, First Horizon, 
with sort of a Southern, again, local feel as well. Fold that into the question of solvency. So in terms of solvency in commercial real estate in particular, one of the benefits is banks are gonna work with their clients. They don't want to own distressed real estate. They don't want to be owners of distressed properties. And so if you look actually back to the great financial crisis and what happened with commercial real estate then, things actually worked out okay. Yes, there were some defaults, there were some workout situations, but it was not a broad-based systemic issue that took things down. I realize that the pandemic has very much changed how we're looking at office space and valuations, especially at higher yields. But in terms of kind of banking exposure to commercial real estate, and our banks team has done a lot of really great work on this, they're not super concerned that this is a broad-based, another domino yet to fall in kind of the line of issues that we've seen so far. What would concern you? What would you need to see that would concern you that you're not seeing right now? So I think in order for things to get really concerning, we need to see capital stop flowing to the parts of the market where it should flow. Investment grade bond market close, right? That's usually consistent with big freezes. And we saw that on the heels of Silicon Valley Bank for you know a full five or six days where the bond market issued zero bonds, which was a little bit unnerving, but we thought that was much more related to issuers saying, whoa, 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 we're gonna sit on the sidelines. We don't need to step into this mess. We can wait it out and see. And a lot of that is because they were so proactive last year, even amid all the market volatility and issuing an awful lot of bonds. And we think that that kind of two-way flow is still Still pretty indicative of credit conditions while they've tightened they're not necessarily super rolling over at this point let's put those two ideas together what would it take for you to recommend buying the bonds of some of these regional banks <laughs> Well, we actually are. So our bank's team has come out with an overweight allocation to banking in general in the U.S. They have some pretty significant calls in the regional banking system. They are kind of viewing valuations as much more attractive than they had been. They're not saying buy everything, right? This is a very credit specific. You have to really be in the weeds, understand what makes these banks tick. And I think part of the problem is banking is confusing. A lot of people do not understand how banks operate, how they make money, how they repay their debt. And so our banking team is very constructive. Would you push back against people who say there needs to be some sort of policy response to uh, act as a stopgap stop measure with some of the distress and the rumors that are percolating through these share prices and, and setting them lower? Do you think that that is unnecessary based on the strength in the vast majority of the sector? You know, I do think that the recent situation highlights how much technology, social media, information flow has changed how bank runs look, especially because you can now go on to your app, move your deposit from one bank to another really easily. And that's for you know small individuals, large corporations. There's a, a much lower bar than there used to be in terms of actually kind of moving around deposits. So I don't necessarily think that we need to have some sort of widespread regulation, but I think that the information flow still needs to improve in terms of why these things are happening, how banking really works, and some of the complications and problems that have been created by you know social media really going after banks and general. Winnie Caesar of Credit Science. Winnie, thank you. Thank you very much thank on the you. credit market, on the banks as well. Some of these banks, Tom, they were investment grade and all of a sudden they were junk very yeah, quickly. I, I, this idea of liquidity and solvency is uh, critical. And, you know, we're making jokes about 2008, but it's the same debate then as it was in 1907 or whatever. Liquidity and solvency are two very, very different emotions. Mm -hmm. And what's been shattered here, frankly, after the ballet yesterday that we witnessed with Jerome Powell, is confidence. And what I would suggest is there's no discussion, to Goolsby's point, of the efficacy of a duration of pause to help heal the system while we wait for them to get the underlying economics to bring rates down. I mean, that's what the market wants. They want the Fed to turn around and move. And that takes time. It takes delta T on the x-axis. So you got to pause, 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 pause. I don't hear that discussion going on. Well, let's be clear, Tom. Pausing at five, I think we found the bite point for the regional banks, haven't we? Yeah, I believe we have. I think a lot of people <laughs> nailed that. It's, it's here. It's 5%. <clears throat> and Lisa, if it's going to be 5% persistently, then there's going to be problems. And that doesn't mean that more banks are going to hit the wall. You guys at home can, can make your own call on those kind of things. But ultimately, you can see the direction of travel here that these banks are struggling to retain deposits because you can get four or five percent elsewhere and if they've done a load of lending where those assets are yielding what three two three can you pay up for deposits of four five it's difficult 
That's the reason why you're seeing the bigger banks do better because they've got a bigger critical mass. But it raises this issue, and we talked about this with a number of people who have come on the show. Is it the speed of how much the rates went up, or is it the level? This is really unknown to me. If it's the speed, then all of a sudden people are shocked to realize all at once, wait a second, we could get more. If it's the level, this is an existential problem that will become more and more evident, especially as the economy starts to uh, deteriorate. The ECB decision just around the corner at about 8.15 Eastern time. We'll catch up with Katrina Dudley of Franklin Mutual reacting to that decision. Looking forward to that conversation. Then about 30 minutes after that, we get an ECB news conference. We've got a lot to get through. After the close, we talked about this a few times. We get Apple earnings a little bit later, but a focus at the moment again on the US banking system. Equity futures, pretty resilient. Tom, I think this is what's amazing about the index. The index supported by these yeah. big tech <clears throat> names, which have delivered on earnings. We've not just had a resilient equity market. The S&P 500 rallied through March and it rallied through April in the face of lenders going under in this country. I strongly, strongly agree. And what it is is a bear market SPX back to level. I mean, we went from negative 20 percent up to near flat on SPX. And you see it with with all this turmoil that's going on. The VIX is still under 20. I find that remarkable. And we got the emotion here today of a VIX of 28. We're nowhere near that. Lisa, I just want to go through these headlines as well from TD Bank and First Horizon. So TD Bank and First Horizon have agreed to terminate this $13 billion merger. This is essentially because TD couldn't offer a date for this to close because they don't have a timeline for regulatory approval. The story right now is First Horizon down 39%. TD positive 1.4%. Your equity market negative 0.3%. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell hinted the U.S. Central Bank's latest 25 basis points interest rate increase could be the last, suggesting that officials may pause their tightening in June. But Powell pushed back against any expectations that the Fed will be cutting rates by the end of the year. Bloomberg's learned that President Biden has picked Fed Governor Philip Jefferson to be promoted to vice chair. The selection could be announced as soon as Friday. Meanwhile, economist Adriana Kugler will be named, nominated to an open Fed board spot. She would be the central bank's first Latina policymaker in its 109-year history. A new poll says almost half of adults in the U.S. worry that their bank deposits aren't safe. That's a level of concern as high or higher than during the 2008 financial crisis. The Gallup poll was conducted last month following the failures of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. TD Bank and First Horizon have agreed to terminate their $13.4 billion merger agreement. In a statement, the two banks said there was uncertainty if and when regulatory approvals could be obtained. As part of the termination agreement, TD Bank would pay First Horizon $200 million. Shares of First Horizon plunged more than 40 percent. The e-commerce company Shopify is selling the bulk of its logistics unit to Flexport. The transaction includes the sale of the shipping service company Deliver, which, bought, which Shopify bought last year for $2.1 billion. In return, Shopify will get a stake at 13 percent in Flexport, and Flexport will become Shopify's official logistics partner. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. The focus is on inflation. They're trying very hard to separate financial stability concerns, system, banking system concerns from monetary policy. We'll see if, if conditions force them to begin to combine financial stability concerns with monetary policy decisions. As of today, they did not do that, and they don't appear to believe they have to do that. It's a good summary of the current Fed and their position from a former Fed official, Dennis Lockhart, formerly of the Atlanta Fed. From New York City this morning, good morning, about 30 minutes away from an ECB rate decision. Would it be 25 or 50? 25 appears to be the consensus. 50 is the call from SOCGEN. Going into all of that, the FX market shaping up as follows on the euro. It's Lisa's favourite currency pair right now. 100%. 110. 
110.68 on the euro against the dollar. Totally unchanged. Let's see if we get some moves a little bit later in the equity market with negative 0.3%. We've got to go back to the story of the moment. Pack West in a pre-market trying to stage some kind of bounce recovery. It's still negative 36%. Ugly off the back of reporting from our colleague, the brilliant Matthew Monks, reporting that Pack West has been weighing a range of strategic options, including a sale, according to people familiar with the matter. That has been confirmed by the company itself, essentially, with a statement overnight into this morning saying the company has been approached by several potential partners and investors. Discussions are ongoing, Tom. The company will continue to evaluate all options to maximise shareholder value. Each of these stories is different. And as John has mentioned through the morning, the deposit stability seems to be actually pretty good at PacWest. Joining us now, our reporter, Matthew Monks, after he moved markets and truly moved all of banking markets last night. Matthew, congratulations on your report. Reporting as simple as I can in the April 25th statement by the leadership of PacWest, they say that credit dynamics are steady. I found that really, really, really important. What are the credit metrics they have? Is it real estate on Rodeo Drive? What do they actually own away from the deposits? Uh, they have a lot of commercial real estate, so that's like multifamily apartment loans. They have a lot of business uh, loans, like so revolving credit lines to businesses. Uh, they have a venture capital lending business. The important thing to understand here, this is not a credit quality issue, uh, not yet at least. It's, 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 it's an interest rate issue, which uh, means that these loans um, are no longer, you know, worth what they were when they wrote them. Uh, they're, you know, they're, their market value is uh, below par. But, you know, they're, they're, they're assuming that they all get paid back, you know, they will be worth whole eventually, but it's really about right. the interest rate and the credit quality is, is it's holding steady, um, which is different than the last crisis. So Matt, let's talk about these strategic options. Go through them one by one, what is on the table here and where you think the priority lies for leadership at this bank. So uh, the ideal solution here would be uh, some kind of uh, uh, rescue merger with another larger institution. It's, it's, a, it's a great franchise w in California. There's a lot of people that'd be interested in expanding California. But the issue, like I said, it, it goes back to this kind of interest rate risk in those loans. Since they're not worth what they uh, used to be, any potential buyer is going to have to take a substantial hit uh, right out the gate, uh, marking down those loans, which would create a lost so it makes it really really hard for someone to buy them so obviously that would be the first priority for them is to find a merger partner but just getting someone to take that well, hit would be an issue bet we just saw the playbook with this right i mean we just yeah, saw the right. idea that basically you just wait for the uh for the fdic to come in and yeah. give you some sort of loan loss uh, agreement and then all of a sudden it's a feasible purchase why is this not just going to end up in the same place oh i don't know yet if you if you can uh I don't know. I'm trying to get my head wrapped around it as well. Now, there is one possible reason. Uh, now, this is a much smaller institution than First Republic. It's much smaller than uh, Silicon Valley Bank. So potentially, you know, a bank could kind of step up and, and eat a loss uh, and make it worth their while. But it's kind of hard to argue with, um, you know, getting a sweetheart deal from the FDIC, I guess. But it's all still to be determined. Matt, I don't want you to uh, tip your hand, but I know that you speak with a lot of people in the world of deal making. How much chatter is there about additional M&A, about additional kinds of tie ups in the banking sector, perhaps under less distressed kinds of circumstances to get ahead of this type of thing? I think everything's dead right now for, for the reason that I mentioned. I think long term you're going to see a lot of consolidation. But right now, everything is just kind of off the table. And especially when you see that TD deal right. unraveling this morning, if, if you're a large institution, how are you going to take that 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 risk that it's going to get shot down? These deals take nine months close to begin with. Now you're going to do a deal and it's just going to be open ended. So no, no, I mean I hate to say it, but unless it's kind of forced or distressed, bank M and A right now is dead. I mean, I don't want you to play sell side analyst here. That's not the Bloomberg way, Matthew Monks. But yeah. in your reporting, even if you have deposit stability from 35 yeah. billion down to 28 billion. Is the other side of the ledger so diminished mark to market that they're at a net capital negative right now? I mean, is PacWest sitting no, I don't think so. zero capital? No, I don't think so. I don't okay. think they're insolvent. And, and, and everybody that I was talking to last night, you know, wasn't indicating that they're solvent. I mean, it's 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 about investors and shorts selling down these banks and just being merciless. Uh, all the institutional investors have fled. You're not really seeing bargain investors kind of get into the stock. It's really, it's just, it's just investor sentiment that's just hammering these banks. I mean, the, the, the three larger banks that failed before, these were really incredibly 
problematic banks with the hundred billion of, of, of troubled assets sitting on their balance sheets. It's, it's not the case here. This is really, it's actually, it's, it's actually, it's actually a really nice franchise in pretty decent shape. It's just getting pummeled, pummeled by investors. Matt, the deposit profile is so different compared to That's SVB, right. and we can put some numbers on that with ease. We did that a little bit earlier. From a reporter's perspective, for you, are you focused on that? Are we focused on the right thing? When we sit here and say deposits have stabilized, which is something the bank yeah, itself I'm, has I'm to communicate. Yeah, I'm focused on that. And that. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going back to the point that they've, so they've, I think 80 percent or so of, the, of their deposits are insured. Uh, that, that that liquidity is not just going to run off um, in, in a heartbeat. Um, um, and, and these, you know, and these are these are insured kind of retail and commercial deposits. Uh, I don't think that we're, we're seeing a run on them. So yeah, I'm absolutely focused on that. And that's why I, I keep putting this message out here that it's, it's a different situation than some of these other uh, uh, institutions. One of the listeners uh, of the program had an amazing question, which is essentially what is what you're saying that the Fed has to cut rates to get bank con yeah. consolidation to take place. Is that kind of what people are waiting for, that opportunity for perhaps a balance sheet that makes a little bit more sense? Yeah, well, I mean, the people are waiting for uh, uh, maybe the government to, to raise the, the deposit insurance cap. That's one thing that could kind of just stabilize thing and then maybe create stability for M&A. Uh, uh, the Federal Reserve, you know, slowing its role when it comes to interest rates. Yeah, at this point, uh, the private market is definitely waiting for some kind of guidance from the government to stabilize things uh, to, you know, foster uh, consolidation one way or the other. Hey, Matt, wonderful to catch up with you, sir. Tremendous reporting. Matt, let's talk again soon Thank you, before the week is out. Thank you, sir. Matthew Monks there on the latest story with PacWest. If it's the case that you have, and the number, by the way, is 75%, insured deposits total 75% at PacWest. If that's the case, does a shift in the FDIC limit even mean anything to a bank with a profile like that, a deposit profile like that, Tom? No, it's not about FDIC. No, right? it's, about, it's about, as he was talking about, the commercial the commercial real estate, excuse me. And, and the best chart out there is from Chris Whalen. I can't remember where he got it from, but it just shows the mark-to-market losses summed across the banking industry now. And that's not why I'm, I'm, I'm gloomy and without hope. But the, the answer is I look at the conversation with the – I mean, the guy hasn't slept in three weeks. Let's start with that. Great report. And, and the answer is people like Matthew Monks are trying to sort out things these banks don't want to talk about or don't want to value. And that's, to me, to me, the key thing. Just one target to the next in this market. It's brutal stuff. <clears throat> You know, we used to talk about the bond vigilantes. Yeah. You know, we're sort of going into banks right now, one to the net to the other. You go from First Republic, we've gone to Pack West. Problem that I see is I don't see a resolution unless you get yields coming in, right? And that's I correct. think what the issue Absolutely is: correct. is that yields uh, were too low for too long. This a lot of people would argue. I'm not right. saying this; I'm reflecting a, a consensus that a lot of people would say. And then all of a sudden, you have an entire loan portfolio pegged to a very different interest rate era. Right. So to this point that the terminal raiser uh, that the uh, the viewer raised, how much are we looking at waiting for a Fed rate cut to solve a well, problem the, the, that otherwise is only going to get worse? And a calculus based. Basis, the way I put this is, you're correct, yields have to come in, but if you go, John, pause, 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 whatever, pause, 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 that's a net present value rate cut while you wait for the Fed to see the ex post data to then finally cut rates. That's not in the zeitgeist this morning, multiple pauses, except maybe from Goolsby. This is all if you believe this is just about deposits and, and rates. I agree. It, it's not. It's and not. your point this morning, Thomas, you don't think it is. I would it hope that would be the mention that issue. I was hoping earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. Chris Turner <laughs> of ING is coming up to talk about the ECB decision. That decision drops in about... We hope he'll show up. Oh, my time. God. I think he's going to. In the equity market, <laughs> I think. <laughs> I hope. We're negative 0.3% on the S&P 500. PacWest is down about 40 ECB up next, 30 minutes after that, a press conference with ECB President Christine Lagarde, who's going to say our financial system is sound and resilient and strong and all of that stuff. From New York, this is Bloomberg. These stresses in the banking sector are likely still there. They're likely still coming. They're likely still tightening financial conditions as we look ahead. You cannot say that it's completely separate what's going on in the banking sector relative to hitting the inflation goal. I think the main thing on the June meeting is we can't rule out 
further policy rate hikes. I do think the goal coming into the meeting was to give themselves the option to pause. I think they can pause and then continue to tighten again if the data turns out to support that. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television, commercial-free in this half hour with a meeting of the European Central Bank. We're looking at bank crisis in America. We're looking at Apple coming out this afternoon. John, none of it matters right now. What matters is Christine Lacard and her carefully mentioned words in the press conference. Inflation still hot. They're set to go 25. That's the estimate in our survey. Some banks out there, including SockGen, think they might go 50. Inflation's hot, but we're starting to see things happen in the banking sector. Lisa touched on this in the last hour. The Eurozone Bank Lending Survey showed a real tightening in lending standards, Tom. And I wonder if we see the same thing from the United right. States in the next week when we get that senior loan officer opinion survey we've all been waiting for. We haven't talked about it. I saw a nice chart here. Yes, inflation elevated in Europe, but even in the angst part of it, it's rolling over ever so slightly. You talk about ex ante, ex post, given the politics of Europe, different from the Fed, how ex post does Lagarde have to be? Well, Germany does not want to see five. They don't want to see six, seven, eight, nine. They certainly don't want to see double figures again in Germany either. I think it's going to be a key difference, though, for this ECB. They're going to make the point that their banking system compared to what's transpiring and materialising, evolving in the United States is very different. Yes. They're going to say we haven't seen banks fail in the same way that the United States has. And I think they're going to make the point that they can keep policy where it is for a long time. And I think the ECB might have the option of making people believe them in a way that perhaps and they didn't with Chairman Powell, given what's developing with PacWest this morning. This is your wheelhouse in your ute. And the basic idea here is, as a Landis Bank and equivalent in Germany, their banks aren't as entrepreneurial. They're not as equity-driven and as growth-driven is the growthiness that got us into this trouble in America. Well, the epicenter of this, and there are loads of different stories in the banking system in America, but I think we need to focus on California. And Tom, I think you've done a great job of looking at what's happened with Silicon Valley, all the lending, the massive growth in deposits through the pandemic at some of these institutions. All of this happened so, so quickly. And then bang, zero to five at the Federal Reserve, just like that. And so many management teams have been caught really offside by that, Tom. And those banks have gone under. So much folk to focus on here, folks. But in this half hour, we're really going to focus on what's going on in Europe. Lisa, just your thoughts holistically. It's a much more fixed income mindset over there. A I mean, Diamond talks about Fortress JP Morgan. All of Europe is a fortress compared to the leverage that we see within the U.S. system. Just to build, though, on what John was talking about, this idea that in the U.S. the problem was how quickly the rates were, were raised and then that really challenged business models that had grown up during a very different interest rate environment. I wonder if Christine Lagarde today is going to hint at that and is going to opt for a 25 basis point increase rather than a 50 basis point increase and a more moderate kind of pace of increasing just simply because right. the lesson from the United States might suggest that perhaps you could have more breathing space to raise a little bit more gradually. If we get hawkish hawkish instead of hawkish pause, I mean, I mean, Lisa's is the expert on this, John, but does Euro pop to a 111, 112? I mean, <laughs> hey, we came close know. to 111 last week. I'm not going to make an FX call for you this morning. That's for sure. But certainly, if you can encourage people to believe that you're going to go again and again yeah. at a time where the Fed is almost communicating a pause, yeah. then certainly rate differentials open up in a different way. To the data check to get to Chris Turner of ING. John, we haven't mentioned it all morning. I'm sorry, American oil, $68.56 a barrel gets my attention. Breaking down, 68 handle on WTI. Bond yields higher, rising by two basis points on a 10-year, 335.24. Much, much lower yesterday and the day before, though, off the back of some of this banking stress. Just to round things out, equity futures negative 0.4% on the S&P 500. Tom, going into Apple earnings a little bit later on. We'll have to see on Apple at 4 o'clock. Look to Scarlet Fu, Romain Bostic for that coverage in the 4 o'clock hour. Joining us right now, steeped in economics and accounting, is ING Bank's Christopher Turner. Chris Turner is global head of markets research for all of ING. Chris, I, I look at the ballet. We're completely focused on the Powell uh, ballet of yesterday. The Lagarde ballet to me is so different. Really, how different is a challenge Christine Lagarde has this morning, given the turmoil? Yeah, I think she'll very much um, focus on delivering what we think at ING will be the 25 basis point rate uh, cut, uh, rate uh, hike that you've been discussing on uh, the show already today. 
But I think the message will probably be a little bit more kind of a hawkish than clearly what we saw from uh, Jay Powell last night. I mean, uh, services inflation seems to be a lot more sticky in the eurozone, and even though they won't sort of pre-commit for another 25 basis points in June. Actually, we think they will hike in June, but I think there'll probably be enough in the press conference and, and the tone of the language to emphasise that the door is uh, very much open for further hikes. The job is not over for this ECB. They're a single-mandate central bank, as you know well, Chris, and quite clearly they're falling short of it, with inflation at 7% in the eurozone. Now, Chris, going on from here, I think what we're starting to see in the US is a struggle in some parts of the financial system with 5% interest rates, at the regional banking level specifically. Chris, when you look across the eurozone, the financial system, the economy, any sign of that developing whatsoever from your perspective? Um, you know, it's, it's certainly kind of not clear. And I think, um, you know, the point you raised earlier, that sort of differentiation at the moment between like the US and the European kind of banking sectors. And that's something that the uh, IMF brought up in its global financial stability report uh, recently, looking at uh, the stock of debt securities on US banks' balance sheets relative to Europe, with those being sort of much higher in the States. So I think very much the focus at the moment is on what you've uh, very well been describing, the to strengthen the system and how it's moved to pack west and uh, what it's meant for interest rate differentials as well with those uh, US rates crumbling at the moment. Is the regional banking crisis or the issues that we're seeing in the United States perhaps analogous not to the banks of Europe but to the real estate of Europe that perhaps is more interest rate sensitive in a more immediate way than in the United States? Yeah, we haven't really been seeing that. I mean, as a, as a theme. I mean, it has been mentioned, particularly places like Scandinavia, in terms of kind of perhaps the, the leverage in the, uh, the, particularly the commercial kind of real estate area. But I think in broader, in the residential side, that really hasn't sort of cropped up a, as an issue um, for markets at the moment. So I think the, the uh, focus very much is uh, front and centre on uh, the US regional crisis at the moment. Based on that, Chris, why not just be really bullish on the European region? Because it means that you could have an ECB that's fighting inflation, but a resilient economy that, as we saw from some of these service uh, data, services data this morning from a number of different European countries, is coming in hotter than expected. Yeah, and uh, I think, as Justin mentioned earlier, there is a case for euro dollar to be trading a lot higher. Um, those yield differentials are narrowed to the, the narrowest spread this year at about kind of 60 base, 65 basis points at the two-year part of the curve. And that does make a very strong case for a higher euro dollar. And I think that will be the core story this year, the euro dollar trades up to 115, maybe higher. The challenge, though, that we see, particularly in FX markets, where I concentrate my activities, is what's happening with, like, U.S. money markets and the cross-currency basis swap, which is starting to show some signs of nervousness again. And that's... Um, clearly not good for the risk environment. And uh, I think with uh, investors pretty long euro dollar already, particularly asset managers, I think they're probably thinking twice about adding to positioning at these relatively high levels. Uh, Chris, how would you expect, and I think it's an important issue, the US dollar to behave? Or how would investors behave towards the US dollar if we went into a period of risk aversion and that period of risk aversion was dominated by the United States at the epicentre of that risk was the US. How would the US dollar react to that? Yeah, it seems counterintuitive, doesn't it, in terms of, uh, as you say, the US is kind of the source of the problem. But we have seen when, particularly conditions in money markets, so we are very much closely looking at things like the three-month euro cross-currency basis swap, seeing that if there's any signs of stress in terms of investors and, and banks wanting to secure dollar funding and paying over the odds to get that dollar funding. That is widening kind of mm -hmm. slightly and also looking at the FRA OIS spread for any signs of money market stress. But if those spike out, which they do on occasion, actually the dollar counterintuitively performs quite well. So in our sort of analysis, we've been sort of recommending defensive currencies. We think things like the yen and the Swiss franc, those with very low correlations to the S&P 500, those are probably the currencies you should be kind of overweight at, at the moment. But um, you could see some can counterintuitive dollar strength, particularly against activity currencies. Canadian, um, for example, the Canadian dollar could be exposed if the risk environment really deteriorated. Interesting, Chris. Thank you, sir. Chris Turner of ING on the FX market and what would happen if we get a period of risk aversion, Lisa, 
and the U.S. was the source of that risk aversion? It's a great question. It's something that a lot of people are, are trying to understand. Are we in a new regime where there suddenly is less preeminence of the dollar in terms of the global currency? A lot of people have come out, tried to debunk that, saying it still is the main currency that is used for all transactions. The IMF coming out pretty, uh, pretty vociferously about that. But even with all of that, there is a different kind of environment if the U.S. is the source of the weakness, as you well highlighted. I don't think they're going to look at the U.S. They are so wedded to the tensions of, of course, Central Europe, Germany, to the Netherlands. John, you mentioned Austria to me uh, the, the other day. How is the Bundesbank going to react to this? The, the core question here away from that is, given this uh, shocking where ECB rates are, John, I still can't frame it. You That's amazing. It than, I'm totally with me, you, Tom. But I don't. I still and I asked Gentilini this at the IMF meetings of Italy, and I said, where's, where's the nominal GDP, the animal spirit to support this interest rate structure? And I'm waiting for, to get an answer from an expert. That's my first question to Lagarde today, and it goes back to eurosclerosis. Are we, are we really beyond it? There was a time in the depths of the pandemic, I remember speaking to, I think, Bob Michael at JP Morgan Asset Management. Do you think that the ECB will go through another cycle without hiking interest rates? Remember, Draghi did a full, full, what, eight years? Yeah. And never hiked once. Never hiked once. And I thought perhaps Christine Lagarde is going to repeat the act, and here we are looking at 4% over at the ECB, which is quite amazing, Lisa. It shows just how much we underestimated inflation and how nobody Big imagined time. this type of inflationary impulse that we have not seen for 40 years. I'd go one step further. That plus, I don't think many people thought that this bond market would tolerate it, particularly on the periphery in Italy. Tolerated so far. Well, yes. We hope. <laughs> we hope. We hope, we hope, we hope it's we hope. tolerated all it, yes. That, all of that good stuff. You brought that back. Chris Ternovanji, <laughs> just brilliant. Thank you. Equities negative 0.4%. The ECB decision coming up. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell has opened the door to a June pause for interest rate hikes. Policymakers raised rates for the 10th time since early last year. And Powell hinted that might be the last one, but he stopped short of declaring victory in the fight against inflation. Bloomberg's learned the European Union is discussing a new sanctions mechanism. It would target third countries that it believes aren't doing enough to prevent Russia from evading sanctions. The process would focus on those that can't explain spikes in trades of key products or technologies. Apollo Global Management has agreed to buy Arconic, which makes parts for the aerospace, automotive and other industries. The all-cash transaction has an equity value of about $3 billion. The deal represents a 36% premium to Arconic's closing price on February 27th. And PacWest is trying to calm markets after a 60% stock surge that made it the new focus of concern over regional banks. The bank says that core deposits have actually increased since March. It also confirmed it's talking with potential investors. Shares plummeted yesterday after Bloomberg reported PacWest was considering strategic options. Bloomberg's learned that President Biden has picked Fed Governor Philip Jefferson to be promoted to vice chair. The selection could be announced as soon as Friday. Meanwhile, economist Adriana Kugler will be nominated to an open Fed board spot. She would be the central bank's first Latina policymaker in its 109-year history. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. About 50 seconds away from an ECB rate decision going into it. Here's the shape of markets right now for you on the S&P 500. Slightly negative through most of this morning. We are negative 0.3% on the S&P. Looking at the bond market shaping up as follows. Yields a little bit higher at the front end of the US curve on Treasuries 382. One basis point higher, actually. Outside of all of that, looking at foreign exchange, euro against the dollar, 110.79. Very close to intraday, year-to-date highs on a single currency. Came very close to 111 just last 
last week with positive there, Lisa, by a little more than 0.1%. And that is a really good way to characterize it because I've been sort of mocking that we've been around the 110 level for about a week now, but it actually has broken out and it is at a higher level. So there is a question of whether it can break out even further, especially given the conversation we just had with the resilience. I'll ask for the euro quote from you in just a moment as we anticipate (laughs) that ECB rate decision. This is what we're looking for, a 25 basis point move from the European Central Bank. Last time around, big conversation about 50 or 25. This is the move right now. It's 25. They go from 350 to 375 on the main refinancing rate. The deposit facility, which has got a ton of attention over the last 10 years, 3% to 325 from the European Central Bank. So that is a 25 basis point hike from the ECB. The inflation outlook continues to be too high for too long. The ECB hike in interest rates by 25 basis points. Just a quick look at the euro. Still in and around. Guess what? 110. 110.68 <laughs> right now. The underlying price pressures remain strong, Lisa. The inflation outlook too high. Just on the APP, the asset purchase program, they expect to stop the APP in reinvestments as of July. Pass rate increases are being transmitted, they say, forcefully. A ton of headlines coming through, Lisa. What have you got? Well, people uh, definitely, I'm just watching the euro, frankly, because you told me to, but I also am watching it because it is sort of feeling that pressure upward as we have a, a very a very clear sense that inflation is the preeminent concern. What I do find interesting, though, is how little response you're getting in markets as you really do have this feeling that the press conference is going to be really key to indicate how much further they think they need to go, how much they're going to try to backstop peripheral bonds, how much they're going to try to create some issues uh, to to mitigate some of the potential pressures from the market response we haven't seen yet. Just going to work through some of the statement for you. They're the initial headlines and some of the price action. Just opening up the statement from the European Central Bank. Overall, the incoming information broadly supports the assessment of the medium-term inflation outlook that the Governing Council formed at its previous meeting. Headline inflation has declined over recent months, but underlying price pressures remain strong. At the same time, they go on to say the past rate increases are being transmitted forcefully to Eurozone financing and monetary conditions, while the lags, going to hear that word a lot, and strength of transmission to the real economy remain uncertain. They go on to say the Governing Council's future decisions will ensure that the policy rates will be brought to levels sufficiently restricted restricted to achieve a timely return of inflation, Tom, to the 2% medium-term target and will be kept at those levels for as long as necessary. Kept. Is that is it French for pause? I mean, you know, I, I, I wonder here about the pausiness of all this, and I don't hear it. I hear the Bundesbank here saying inflation's what it is, and we really need to... There's a vigilance here I didn't hear yesterday. I think there's a line there, Tom, that's yeah. important. It just implies there are a few steps behind where the Federal Reserve is at. Yeah. By saying this, that future decisions will ensure that the policy rates will be brought to levels sufficiently restricted to achieve a timely return of inflation at 2%, implies there's more to come here, Lisa. Which I think was the large expectation because they are so far behind what we saw with the Federal Reserve. Just taking a look at the market response, I find it interesting that two-year yields in Italy are rising, not incredibly, but just a little, while two-year yields in Germany are coming down, not incredibly, but just a little bit. And this, to me, is the divergence to watch Uh, as that peripheral region uh, really does start to come under pressure. I can't show and tell this, John, in real time here. It's too important to get to Katrina, but it's really important to understand nominal GDP in Europe, the Eurozone as it's defined, is where it was in 2008. Granted, it's up off the bottom of like the middle of the last decade at 3% per year, but it's a shadow of what you see in terms of the animal spirit of the United States. And this is Italy behind in other countries. You're better at this than I am, but I just don't think you can apples and apples the Fed and the ECB. I think there's two stark different stories. Let's get over to Frankfurt and catch up with our colleague, good friend, Maria Tadeo, on the latest decision. Maria, you've had a chance to go over this one. What jumps out for you? Uh, well, Jonathan, it was 25 basis points. Uh, remember, we had a lot of data this week, uh, which uh, pointed to core inflation cooling in April. Uh, that was seen as a key factor going into this decision. Obviously, that would show that the transmission uh, is working and core inflation, which we know it's not the target, but is the number that they really focus on. That played a part in this decision. And then you also had that lending survey that came out two days ago, which kind of showed credit conditions were really also tightened in the euro area. A lot of this uh, providing the basis for a downshift. 
shift, which is 25 basis points. There's a number of uh, lines here that are also interesting where they say, obviously, inflation is still unacceptably high. That points that there is more to cover. It'll be interesting to see whether or not she paints a sequence for the time being. They just say, we will stay data dependent. Uh, and, and, and overall, uh, to me, the question was, would they go 50? Was that still in play or actually go for a downshift? And they've gone for the most cautious approach. Maria, wonderful to get your perspective. We'll catch up with you after the news conference. That's going to begin in about 25 minutes time or so. I have to admit, when I was working through the statement and you read this line that the past rate increases have been transmitted forcefully to Eurozone financing and monetary conditions, the lags and strength and transmission to the real economy remain uncertain. Kind of tease up what you think might be a pause and then you read the next line. The future decisions will ensure that the policy rates will be brought to levels that are sufficiently restrictive. That tees up another move down the line, doesn't it? One more and then hold or something, basically. Maybe, all, who knows? All I can say is how lucky is Christine Lagarde that she goes after Jay Powell, that she gets to learn from how the market responded to everything that he did and listens to all of his comments and then can be like, OK, don't do that. OK, yeah, do that. And then she can come out and nuance the statement. Well, they just so happen to be behind in the process, Tom. It's not just about the calendar coming after him a day after. I know what you're saying. No, no, but, but it's true. They're behind in the process as well. Yeah, they're behind in the process, but it's a completely different political mix. And, and I, John, the inflation numbers I'm witnessing, which frankly you and your family are, wit are living in the United Kingdom and Europe, they're nowhere comparable to the United States. Take the worst story, worst anecdote in the United States, and it's a walk in the park compared to what citizens are feeling in Greece or the United Kingdom or Finland. Well, we can have this conversation with our next guest. It yeah, has much please, better bring her, yeah. clarity on that than I do. Katrina yeah. Dudley joins us now, Portfolio Manager at Franklin Mutual Series. <clears throat> Katrina, can we start there? The difference in the inflation that the Eurozone is experiencing right now and that we are home in the United States. Is there a big difference from your perspective? Um, we need to think about what's generating the inflation in the Eurozone region and what has been generating it. And, and the, the war in Ukraine has really not come to light for such a long period of time. But that's really what is reflected in those European inflation numbers. It's the fact that someone cut off the gas supply and we needed to replace that gas. And that is the inflation that people are dealing with. But we keep talking about it. And I think it's so important. It's the reaction of the governments that we have been very, very positive upon in terms of that incremental help that they're providing to their citizens. And I think that that is where there's that disconnect, is that the population is actually quite happy because they're getting support and they're getting help, so they're not protesting in the streets. What's fascinating to me, and this came up at the meetings of the IMF, and we have Lagarde. John, when is Lagarde? Like in an hour? 8.45. It, oh, it's only like so 20, 20, 20 minutes. 20 minutes yeah, Tom. yeah, it's going to be here in, in a brief. She's speaking a different language to a different culture and fabric. And I wonder, within all your study, Bond University, all the work you've done in equities, are we at a point where we can say they've gone beyond eurosclerosis and that they have a financial structure more like us, more Anglo-Saxon, if you will, than what we knew when we were studying this? Um, it's transitioning. I think that the bond market in the Eurozone is still not as robust as the bond market that we mm -hmm. hear, see in the United States. And what does that mean is that you know, companies don't go into bankruptcy that is driven by the bondholders and the breaching of those covenants because the debt is held in the right. banks. And the banks tend to be wanting to work with their customers on a longer period of time. So even though you've had that transition, it's not been you know, a, a really noticeable one. But look, they're data dependent. I mean, who does not want to hear the fact that the people running the ECB are looking at the data and they're being informed by the data and they're saying that, you know, the core inflation number is still high. It's at 5.6 percent on a core basis. That's significantly above two. Um, you know, we're not talking the difference between two and three. We're talking, you know, multiple points higher and they need to, I think forcefully was the word, but they need to really push that number down. So we haven't instated it yet, but data dependency is, is a key phrase on the show where you're going to have an alarm go off and then we'll say, well, what exactly do you mean by that, right? And it means something different for everybody. For right now, the Federal Reserve, it means a senior loan officer survey and perhaps what happens uh, with respect to regional banks. In Europe, is it just core inflation? Is that the preeminent data dependency that we're looking at? 
I think that they're looking at a multiple of factors. They're looking at what's happening in spreads in the periphery. And we saw that a, about a year ago where you saw that blowout in spreads in Italy and the ECB reacted. So that's one area of data they're looking at. They are looking at inflation. They're also looking at Eurozone in your employment metrics because one of the mechanisms for your know, inflation, it needs to be wage adjustment because you know, people need to get that to be able to cope with it. And so they're looking at whether or not those higher wages are causing employees to be laid off. So there's a lot of different factors they're looking at. Katrina, thank you thank for you. jumping on the, into the studio and catching up with us. Thank you. Katrina Dudley there, Franklin Mutual, on the latest CCB decision. 25 basis point hike. News conference about 20 minutes from now. The euro, the single currency against the dollar, 110.50 on the euro with negative 0.1%. Lisa does not get the move that she was hoping for. Well, which what, move break out of 110? <laughs> oh, no, I want this to stay at 110 for another two weeks. Another two weeks. Yeah, it makes it easy. At least. Coming up in the next hour on Bloomberg TV, following the news conference from the ECB, Alessia De Longis of Invesco and, drumroll, Megan Green of the Kroll Institute. Megan, yes. of course, selected to join the MPC at the Bank of England He's as an external curtains. member on a yeah. three-year term beginning later this summer, I believe, Tom. So very cool to catch up with her ahead of that. Really cool to catch up with her. And she has a transatlantic reach in policy that I'm sure will be a benefit there. I love the way you... But the, the Bank of England does it better than the Fed. You've said that. they got Catherine Mann. they got Megan Green. You Green. like that they I mean, have external members. I do. I do. Yeah. I like that they had Adam Posen. I like they had David Blanche Flower on and on. I hear you. Know, you. I hear you. I feel it. Well, you said that, not me. In the equity market on the S&P. We're negative 0.4%. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance, Lisa Bramwitz and Tom King, John Farrell preparing for the next dashing hour of what we do here. We've got lots coming up, including important claims data onto the jobs report tomorrow. And I'll be looking at unit labor costs. Someone here to give us wisdom is Lisa. Did you notice once again, McKee made the chairman pause yesterday? <laughs> and then not answer his did question. Did you see how he did that? I love that. that. And then say, you know, but what about what about the cuts? Exactly. You know, yeah, there's say there's, after, there's you know. a hawkish pause, and then there's a McKee-ish pause, and we got that <laughs> yesterday. Right now, without further pause, Michael McKee on the, today's data. Yeah. Well, Tom, uh, jobless claims front and center because the Fed, of course, is worried about inflation from wages and the, in the tightness of the labor market. 242,000, a major rise from last week's 230,000 drop. Uh, the forecast was for 240, though, so it isn't uh, hugely out of line, but it does show a little bit higher baseline for jobless claims. Tom wanted to know about unit labor costs yep. up 6.3%. In the first quarter, uh, non-farm productivity overall down 2.7 percent. So not good news on the productivity and cost front does show inflation pressures remain. Uh, and then uh, the trade balance comes in at negative uh, 64 billion dollars. Uh, that is down from negative 70.6. So it's one of the reasons. And we saw this in the data that uh, the first right. quarter growth came in uh, high, a little bit higher than we had thought. I want you to get to unit labor costs. Stephen Rusciuto is going to help us out here in a moment, Mike, but let me have your word on it. I know productivity is really moldy, to be polite. Are unit labor costs a proxy for inflation? Uh, they're a proxy for, I would say, a contributor to inflation. And it's a backward-looking number because it's quarterly, so it incorporates January, February, and March. But basically, it's telling you that uh, there were labor cost pressures, higher labor cost pressures in the first quarter than in the fourth quarter. And uh, that is something that we already knew. Now the question is, uh, you, you know, what do we see in the second quarter? Does that go down? Because according to the data that we've had on wages and salaries, they have eased a little bit as the quarter went on. And this is something that Jay Powell himself really spoke to, saying he doesn't believe this is the main driver coming from the wage picture yesterday. I do want to just uh, get your sense, Mike, about what Jay Powell did say to your question about why the market is consistently pricing in rate cuts before the end of the year, even though the Federal Reserve is insisting upon holding rates where they are for the foreseeable future. 
Well, the market seems to be betting that we're going to see inflation fall faster than the Fed anticipates. Mm -hmm. uh, the Fed thinks it's going to be a very slow process, that they've got the low-hanging fruit. Well, the market thinks either the Fed is going to be very successful in what it's doing or we're going to go into recession. <clears throat> in either well. case, inflation goes down a lot and the Fed's going to be forced to cut rates. I don't think Powell wanted to spark the market reaction that he did in answering my question by leaving open the possibility it right. could happen. But, uh, you know, it is possible if uh, if the inflation data break the right way for well, them. Mike, you were as rude as we always expect. Michael McKee, thank you so much, running all of our economic coverage here. And, of course, it's important questions to the chairman yesterday. Here's what we're going to do in the next half hour. We are commercial-free to you worldwide on radio and television uh, in this hour. We're going to go to the Lagarde press conference. Yes, we'll have first word news. But right now, to get us there, Stephen Rusciuto joins us. Steve Rusciuto is chief economist at Mizuho, and yes, it is on the American economy. But Stephen, I've got to start with the EU here and the challenges that uh, Madame Lagarde faces. The idea here is the animal spirit of the United States, our technical superiority, say Apple earnings this afternoon is one example, gives us a certain, as Ned Phelps of Columbia would say, dynamism. Does Europe have the dynamism to have a higher interest rate regime? Well, part of the problem that they face is, is all the conditions that you just laid out. But in addition, there's a demographic issue. Um, and there is a wage subsidy issue, which um, certainly adds to the whole concept of the whole eurosclerosis uh, discussion that we had been having for years about Europe. And I think Europe is aging rapidly, um, and they're finding a way not to, to keep their best educated people on the sidelines in a very comfortable lifestyle. At least I want to note the Euro craters here. I, I, I mean, this is widely anticipated by uh, uh, John Farrell. The Euro cr craters, as I would say on on, on radio, to a, a 11021. Yeah, to 120. Uh, yeah, exactly. Here, this is what I'm watching. Actually, it's exactly the chart that I have up. Not just because I'm waiting for it to break out of the 110 range, you but just Steve, wait to be proven correct. I'm curious. I don't know what correct would mean for me at this point, but I will. I am curious about whether Steve, you think people have overplayed the Europe strength story, the ability to withstand both higher rates and consistent growth that was sort of the consensus heading into this meeting. And then all of a sudden, they took the lesser of the two options with the ECB today. And then in the U.S., you see that the uh, data is still strong. Does this underscore something that is important. Well, I think there is that measure. And I think when you're looking at the oil numbers, just I know people are talking about a fat finger mistake in terms of the decline in oil. But I think what you're seeing is globally around the world, you're not seeing the kind of resilience. You're not seeing it coming out of the Chinese opening. You're not seeing it coming out of Europe. And I think, yeah, there's a greater potential for Europe to run into resistance, especially I heard one of your commentators talking earlier today about the fact that Europe has a much closer connection in terms of its mortgage environment relative to the interest rate environment than we do in the United States because we have fixed rate mortgages, they have adjustable rate mortgages, and the net result is they have a bigger economic impact from what's going on. Well, let's build on that, because I was wondering whether their mortgage situation is akin to the regional banking situation in the U.S. You need the nodes of stress that are emerging are distinct depending on what kind of capital markets each region has. Do you think that the mortgage issue in Europe could become the new regional banking crisis in terms of people unable to pay uh, for their monthly bills? Yeah, w without getting into to the specifics of it, I think at this particular juncture, I think you're probably okay. And one of the reasons mm -hmm. for it is because of the social safety net that's created in Europe. Uh, but I think in addition to that, you're in an environment where, you know, people in Europe are quicker to adjust their spending as a result of this. Um, so I think, you know, you're looking at a, at a potential downturn in the economy uh, relative to the strength everyone was looking for. Am I going to say it's going to be a deep or significant downturn at this particular juncture? I can't make that call. But I do think it adds right. to the growth to the recession forecast as the regional bank problem adds to the recession forecast here. And if you look at all the data we've gotten out this week, you know, get a lot of it's March data, some of it is April data, it's all strong. Even when you look at the claims number this morning, 242. Between 250 and two, between 200 and 250, you're not in a recession. That's residual. You've right. got to get into that 250 to 3 area to start saying, okay, it's a really shallow recession, and then you keep on going up from there. And then you look at claim, continuing claims, they dropped again. So, you know, we don't have that labor market issue that I think a lot of people right. um, are concerned about yet. If you're just joining us on radio and television, Stephen Rusciuto of Missoula with us. We could go for three hours with him with the experience of 
the American economy. Let's turn to America right now. I want you to dovetail in with your colleague Dominic Constum's idea of a Fed with monetary policy, but with other stuff, including the banking crisis, becoming, as Constum states, super restrictive. How close are we to Rashudo super restrictive? You know, I mean, I think the Federal Reserve has a way out of this that would be very, very simple. And I think the, one of the things that they should do immediately is end quantitative tightening. Uh, part of the problem in the overall scenario for the outlook for the U.S. economy is the fact that the Federal Reserve is taking down its balance sheet. And the Fed seems to believe taking down its balance sheet will not lead dollar to dollar to taking down reserves. Mm -hmm. It is taking down reserves. And the net result is that's amplifying the problems. So the Federal Reserve, you know, this is the second time they've attempted to do both an interest right. rate increase right. and a quantitative right. tightening. And they've blown it both times. OK, but is this like a British austerity? Uh, the United Kingdom buried itself with some, you know, philosophical 20th century austerity a number of years ago. Do we have an austere Jerome Powell? Well, I, I think the Federal Reserve is overplaying its hand by using both quantitative tightening and interest rate policy at the same time. They should separate the two. They should use one at a time. And they should recognize that largely when you go into a quantitative easing standpoint, you do it and you assume it is permanent because you've done it because you're afraid of deflation. OK, this concept that it's equivalent to an interest rate reduction is wrong. We're in a free reserve environment. Building on that, just over in Europe, and we are about six minutes from the press conference with Christine Lagarde, who heads the ECB, uh, one person saying, and I'm Maria today bringing us this, uh, that the most key uh, point for the press conference will be that they are ending reinvestment of the APP, basically uh, one of their main bond purchasing, asset purchasing programs. And this was sort of a nod to the hawks to basically say, OK, we are going to get rid of this program more quickly, even though we're not going to raise rates by 50 basis points. What are you looking for in terms of what Christine Lagarde has to say about this? Again, I think they're going to go down the same path that we've gone down. There is this misconception that what you put in, you can take out. When you're looking at the reserves in the system, the bank's balance sheet expands to the level of reserves that are provided. And it's harder to shrink the balance sheet than it is to expand the balance sheet. And this is why the Fed thinks, well, if we put it on automatic pilot, we let it, let it run in the background, everything's fine. Okay, that's fine to some extent, but you're also raising interest rates. So the reality is separate the two. Leave them as separate policies because they are distinctly separate policies <clears throat> guided for very dis distinctly different things. So I think what the Fed should do and I think what the ECB should right. do is leave one alone, do one, and then come back to the other. The ECB so far has only focused on one. The Fed was doing both at the same time. We've gotten into a problem with less taking out of the system right. now than we did in 2018 and 2019. Don't be a stranger. Stephen Rusciuto with us with Mizzou. Just a terrific team between Steve Rusciuto and Dominic Constum uh, over at the Japanese. Uh, bank. Lisa, we've got to look at the data here, and, and my head's spinning on the two-year yield. I think it was 4.xx, uh, two cups of coffee ago, and we were at a 380, and now we're back up four basis points to 384, and I would suggest that was on unit labor costs, which uh, you know are, are an original statistic right now for me. I don't have that chart in front of me, but... Coming in at 6.3% you know. versus the expected 5.5%, this is sort of the key issue, <clears throat> that inflation still is remaining hot, and the labor market is not cracking to the degree that people thought that it might. I mean, to Steve's point, initial jobless co claims coming in at 242, but revised lower well, the, the week before. So this is definitely pointing to ongoing sort of strength, non-recessionary types and, of And this goes markets. to what Luzetti talked about at Deutsche Bank yesterday and also Bill Dudley of the New York Fed and now with Bloomberg Opinion, this idea of if you pause, is it asymmetric or can it be symmetric? Dudley was heated, as I think Steve Rusciuto is, that that you can have a pause and go either way. And certainly this inflation data gives them room to move here in June, July, or on to whatever the next seven meetings are as well. Here's what we're going to do. Is stay with us on radio and television. We are going to go to First Word News and then a conversation of the European press in Frankfurt with Christine Lagarde. We'll bring you that in a number. I'm thinking three minutes will bring you that. Christine Lagarde in three minutes. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. 
keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell hinted the U.S. Central Bank's latest 25 basis points interest rate increase could be the last, suggesting that officials may pause their tightening in June. But Powell pushed back against any expectations that the Fed will be cutting rates by the end of the year. A new poll says almost half of adults in the U.S. worry that their bank deposits aren't safe. That's a level of concern as high or higher than during the 2008 financial crisis. The Gallup poll was conducted last month following the failures of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. A judge has dismissed Donald Trump's $100 million suit against the New York Times over an award-winning report on his taxes. The judge also ordered the former president to pay the paper's attorney's fees and costs. The Times report said the Trump real estate business claimed suspiciously low valuations on properties to minimize tax liability. In Atlanta, police have arrested the suspect in a fatal shooting at a medical building after a manhunt that lasted several hours. They say he stole a vehicle after the attack and later fled on foot. And one person was killed and four others wounded. The suspect's sister says her brother was not mentally stable. The Canadian e-commerce company Shopify is taking more steps to recover from last year's slump. The company is cutting jobs for the second time in less than a year. It's also selling the majority of its logistics business to Flexport. CEO Toby Lutka says that after today, Shopify will be smaller by about 20 percent. At the end of last year, the company had 10,000 employees. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.